Good afternoon. I'd like to call to order the Monday, April 1st, Board of Supervisors regular meeting. We could stand for the Pledge of Allegiance and a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Moment of silence. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, I'll make a motion to adopt the agenda as presented. We have a motion. Do I have a second? I'll second Grant's motion. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? time for a budget discussion uh, which I, I don't think there will be today but if there is time um, maybe we can uh, find an agreeable way to work that in when the time comes do you want um, do you want to just suggest where we put it in I, I have no I have no objection to that I don't think we'll have time and we can we can add it later if needed but I just want to mention that in case there is an option to do that okay sure. during the <clears throat> during the day or night well any time would be fine with me I have a feeling both are going to go pretty long, though. We'll see. All right. Uh, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Moving into presentations, is Dr. Grimsley? Uh, Dr. Grimsley is not able to be with us. She's enjoying her spring break. Uh, she did pass along the calendar of events, which is attached to uh, board docs for everybody to see and hopefully participate in events at school. Excellent. Madam Chair, um, <clears throat> I did have, um, a, I would have had uh, a couple of questions for Dr. Grimsley, but I wonder, I, I know Ms. Jewell is here at our last budget work session, if I may. Sure. At our last budget work session, uh, we talked through the potential um, increase in local funding to the school system, um, which would be somewhere in the range of a, a 8% increase over our funding in fiscal year 24, which is $9.4 million. I believe the request from the school is $10.142 million this time around for FY25. And I did ask um, the superintendent um, for a reconciliation worksheet to account for any additional revenue coming from um, out of county students who um, are having the effect of increasing the ADM and then also to uh, so to add that revenue um, to what we funded in FY24 and then to um, reconcile back to the $10.142 million request and I was just curious if we received um, from the superintendent any any of that information and if we at least from a broad category perspective can account for what comprises the seven or eight percent increase in requests to us. I did receive something from her on Friday, but haven't had a chance to really dive into it yet. Okay. But we'll plan to get that to the board tomorrow at the latest. Okay. Um, thank you. And then I think my second request to her was to uh, demonstrate to the extent possible um, how the schools um, could um, operate soundly if if they were funded at um, level funding at nine point four million dollars or um, or the prior year eight point nine million dollars and did she provide any of of that information so far I did not see that in the email on Friday um, but recall she did say to the board that she would need to talk to the school board about that okay all right but at least as far as the first uh, reconciliation I requested we should be getting that shortly thank you okay that's all thank you thank you all right moving into uh, company four monthly report Good afternoon. Good afternoon. 
Uh, in March, we had um, responses to 10 EMS calls and no responses to 12. We had responses to 12 fire calls and no response to one fire call. Let me focus on Wednesday the 20th. I think uh, Darren can, is going to talk about that a little bit, but um, Company 4 had three apparatus. I had to look it up to make sure that's the plural. Um, responded with seven members. The first of these, Brush 4, responded with a deeply experienced firefighter, recently retired from a long and distinguished career in the professional fire service. Be far quicker to list the certifications he doesn't have than the ones he does. Brush 4 ultimately responded to three separate fires that day and finished the day at Battle Mountain with a crew of four. Brush truck put no fewer than eight tanks of water onto the fires. Utility 4 responded with members who helped with traffic direction, food and water distribution, and liaising with Rick. Tanker 4 responded with two members, both with numerous certifications and proficient in the operation of the tanker. Three members responded to the station looking for ways to help, but after communicating by cell phone with our members in the field, decided eh, we'd probably just be in the way and we wouldn't know what to do. So we are going to talk about how to capture that willingness, that spirit of volunteerism, and put it to use in an effective and safe way, but we're going to make sure it's safe. Chief asked me to mention that all seven members are still in the EMT class, and that's worthy of mention because it's a heck of a lot of material. And I'm so pleased that everybody's hanging in there. We have two new EVOC drivers. Um, all that needs to happen is that they need to be released. We have one certified firefighter in the process of affiliation who resides in Flint Hill and a paramedic who lives in Flint Hill in the process of affiliation. Um, and that's... Um, I want to thank the county for help in identifying the course instructor and company that's providing the EMT course. I've been involved in teaching emergency medicine for over 30 years. And the company and the people he brings in and he himself as the lead instructor are really good. Mm -hmm. And I hope when we have a full-on EMT course next that's not a hybrid after the EMR course that we'll be able to get this guy back. Great. Um, I think the, a, a big reason everybody's hanging in there with the huge amount of material, you know, medical, two years of medical school in, a, in 120 hours uh, is because of him. Wow. So thank you very much for wow. that. Can I answer questions? He's either a Rappahannock County citizen or very nearly a Rappahannock County citizen. We ought to make him an honorary one if we yes, can. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> very close, Slick Mills area. I think I would be intimidated teaching you, uh, given your experience, but it sounds like you've been somehow learning something in the process. I, uh, I have, and uh, he handles me very well. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine. Could Thank you. you just oh. review the EMS numbers? I'm sorry, was it? Sure, I'm were, sorry if I wasn't there were 12, too quick. I think that it might, I, either you <clears throat> transposed them when you said them or I transposed them when I wrote them down. So there were a total of 22 EMS calls, and we got out on 10 of them and didn't on 12. Okay. Fire calls, there were 13. We got out on 12, and one we didn't get out on. Um, and I've talked before about how the numbers are, we're trying to achieve a consistency about the way they're reported, and I think you addressed that, uh, Ms. Smith. Uh, these are based on our reports that we fill out when we go back to the station after calls. So I have confidence in the way they're being counted. Even if somebody went, like, by personal vehicle to the scene of something, that gets reported, written up, and, and dropped in the box. That's good. And they result in a transport? No, we didn't transport anybody this month. Um, anything else? Okay, thank you all very Thanks much for your service. Thank you. Thanks for thank your service. You. All right, Library Board of Trustee annual presentation. <coughs> what would you like me to display? If, any? Um, if you want to go ahead to the first. A little first. lower, you can squeeze okay. the grip and yeah. it'll go up. Thank you. Is that good? Okay. You want to see? So that would be the last one. Okay. 
think that's the first one I refer to. Let's see. Yes. And then the others go in the order I sent them. So. Oh, they're all, I, I combine them. Oh, okay. Well, you should be said. I'll let you know. Okay. Thank you for your continued support. It has been an exciting year for us as we continue to expand library programming, increase library services, welcome 287 new library <clears throat> card holders, and continue developing our collection to meet the unique needs of our community. Libraries everywhere are evolving, and we are part of the evolution. We are more than books. We are movies, musical instruments, steam kits with hands-on activities, adventure backpacks, state park backpacks with activity supplies and free parking passes for any Virginia state park, dementia kits that use reminiscence therapy to build connections, a seed library with flower, vegetable, and fruit seeds available, all for free. COVID test kits at no cost. We are computers, wireless internet, video relay service, printing, faxing, scanning, copying. We are online resources, including downloadable ebooks, audiobooks, magazines, language learning toolkits, resume and career resources, homework help, genealogy and research databases, and much more. We are a community center. We offer free programming for all ages. We are a place for seniors to learn about social security and health care. We are a place for young families to enjoy story time and make new friends. We are a place for teens to hang out, eat pizza, watch movies, play games. We're a place for meetings, study, connection, magic, puppets, ro robotics, animals, music, singers, artists, authors, exercise, and wellness. We are resources. We are technology. We are culture. We are entertainment. We are support. We are reader's advisory. We are early literacy. We are lifelong learning. We are friends. We are professionals. We are researchers. And we have great books. If we do not have what you're looking for, we'll even consider purchasing it for our collection or borrowing it from another library using our interlibrary loan system. I want to tell you about some of our upcoming programming and services that include preschool story time every Wednesday, teen movie night on April 4th, chair yoga on April 9th, basic computer help sponsored by our friends of the library on April 10th, a local author celebration with 14 participating local authors on April 13th, our award-winning program, Senior Art at the Library on April 18th, Basic Computer Help again on April 24th, and Tyler Reed, Family Ma Magician on April 27th. <clears throat> and you may have noticed that I said our award-winning program, Senior Art at the Library. I am thrilled to share with you that the Rappahannock County Library was presented the Virginia Public Library Directors Association's Outstanding Adult Program, yeah, just one award, for having the most outstanding adult program, serving a population under 25,000. And many of our senior art at the library programs were made possible by Rappahannock Association for Arts and Community Claudia Mitchell Arts Fund Grant, so I do extend our gratitude to them as well. Okay, now if you look at the screen, you'll see a graph of our FY 2018 to FY 2023 library visits count. Of course, our numbers dipped during COVID, and last year we bounced back to more than 11,000 visits. FY 2023, we had 14,344 library visitors in the actual library, not just our meeting room. This was in the library during library hours. In the next graph, great, thank you, shows you how many people attended library programs and how many library programs we offered during that time frame. You can see our upward trend for the last fiscal year and our record number of programs, 64 programs offered with 1,421 attendees last fiscal year, 2023. The next graph. Sorry, I didn't realize it was too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sorry. Okay. That one gives you an idea of how important our, our meeting room is to our community. The number of non-library uses, so that's not our library programs, not our story times, nothing to do with us, skyrocketed from 186 in FY 2022 to, look at that, 411 in FY 2023. So we have a lot of groups using our meeting room as it's one of the only, if not the only, in the area, in the county. That is. 
And so the, the couple that happened in FY21 was probably the Board of Supervisors, or me at Arts. <laughs> well, the board met electronically. <laughs> it's possible. And another peek into our evolving library is in the final charts there that show you how much our circulation has changed during the same time frame. In FY 2018, 22,002 physical items, such as books, audiobooks, and DVDs circulated. 2,401 electronic titles were downloaded from our OverDrive or Libby collection, and there were only seven circulations of other items. At that time, our only other item was an adventure backpack. And then looking at last year, 22,250 physical items circulated, 5,440 electronic titles were downloaded, and 300 other items, now including those adventure backpacks, state park backpacks, steam kits, and musical instruments, circulated. And then the next one. Okay, so you, you all have been provided a quick stats card with a snapshot of our fiscal year 2023 library statistics, which surpassed last year's numbers. I handed out those uh, cards last year. I don't expect you to expect you to still have them. I'll go over a few of the highlights here. Um, but if you do, great. <laughs> so for reference, we added 233 new patron accounts in fiscal year 2022 and 287 in fiscal year 2023. That is a 23% increase in new patron accounts added since the previous year. And during fiscal year 2022, we circulated 23,915 items total compared to our 27,990 items in fiscal year 2023. And that's a 17% increase in circulation. We conducted 6,646 reference transactions in fiscal year 2022, 6,971 in fiscal year 2023, increasing about 5% over the previous year. And in fiscal year 2022, 10,114 wireless user sessions were logged. That's people jumping onto our wireless, either in the building or in the parking lot. And then this year, this past year, that number was 10,678, and that's a 6% increase. Our public internet computers were used 728 times in fiscal year 2022, and 1,163 times this past fiscal year. That's a 60% increase. So people are really coming to the library for technology, clearly. We are growing, we are adapting, we are evolving, yet we are keeping the Rappianic feel, charm, and personalized resources and services that our patrons love. And I do encourage you all to let your constituents know the things we offer and how much we would love to help them. So just send them to us and you guys drop in too. Maybe two at a time. <laughs> and now Victoria Fortuna, president of the Library Board of Trustees, would like to provide an update from the trustees. Thank you all so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi, I'm Victoria Fortuna. I'm the current president of the Library Board of Trustees. We have some library board members here. That, let's see, there's John Beardsley, Patty Peterson, Maureen Harris and Bonnie Jewell, in addition to me. Spread, it is notice. Yeah, and we're spread out. Um, I just wanted to give you an update on what we've been doing with our expansion and renovation um, project. Over the last year, we have been working diligently with our architect, architect uh, Gil Ensminger from Enteros. And um, last meeting, last week, we have decided on a kind of basic design. We've been able to pare down what we originally, our huge wish list of things. And so now we're down to the, just under 10,000 square feet, but we've been able to pretty much include everything that we were told by the citizens of the county were, that they would like to have and want to have. And um, John and Patty and Judy DeSarno and Kit Johnston have been working very hard, they're our expansion committee. They've been working very hard over the past year to finalize the design and to really get it to a point where we're minimizing really expensive things like site work and um, that sort of thing. And um, anyway, we're hoping that there will be schedule on your 
next board meeting for us to come and present the new design and to have Gil um, Ensminger give a brief presentation on the facilities and how it would work. We do still anticipate that we will need to close the library once construction is underway, but um, we have some alternatives to help minimize that through the use of the book barn and that sort of thing. So that's, it. that's all I had. John, did you want to add anything? Or? John is the chairman of the Expansion and Renovation Committee. Right. And, um, John, John, please come up. Okay. John Beardsley. Yep. Yes, Victoria says we have an architect and we have a preliminary concept plan. Um, it, I think it's really proportionate to our needs and to the resources that might be available to us in the county and the region. Uh, and it really meets the main objectives that the library staff spelled out and that the community told us uh, we needed. Uh, an improved community space, a larger community space, uh, improved and larger children's space, and uh, new uh, program space for teens and adults. Um, so a, pro, uh, a space reserved for teens and a space reserved for additional adult activities like the painting classes and the chair yoga and so forth that we've been doing. So um, we know we've got some work ahead of us in terms of fundraising. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, We're hoping but, to magnetize a lot of money towards the library. Yeah. <laughs> and um, we are hoping that w we'd have the opportunity to present the preliminary concept, which involves building out both sides of the building uh, and um, taking advantage of the views and the, the, the topography of the site and, uh, and introducing a lot more natural light into the building. And so I, I think we're on track with a really interesting proposal, and we look forward to briefing you on it. Thanks a lot. And then a, a much more simple roof line, I assume. Oh, much, yeah, much, <laughs> much better. Much more simple roof line because we're building off the ends and not out the front. <laughs> simple roof lines, and we're reducing the anticipated footprint from about 12,000 feet to about 9,000 feet, and we're also um, uh, reducing the anticipated cost by. Um, uh, a significant amount. Good. And also we're keeping the sort of architectural and idiom that is already present. So it's not going to be something And you're giving away glaring. everything for next week. Yeah. Next week. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Yeah, I think stay what tuned we've done. We welcome everybody from the community to come. Yeah. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, I did have one question oh. for, for Amanda, actually. And oh. since we're talking big infrastructure, this is like, this, this is embarrassing to ask. But, um, you're currently hosting the UPS Dropbox. Oh, yes. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, these are the things that constituents truly pay attention to. Um, the FedEx Dropbox, mm -hmm. is that still, um, is you're still trying it's to It's something that? we would love to have, and I did speak to our FedEx driver very recently. Okay. Um, and he told me to just call their Winchester number okay. and try to speak with someone that way that they don't check their emails. Okay. Yeah, I tried as... their online form, which yeah. obviously goes into black. Yeah. yeah, so I, I mean, I'll communicate with Gary and one of us or both of us can. Yeah, and if, if we can help in that. any way, yes. I mean, it's in our county. Clearly, right. these drop boxes are so critical. Right. And uh, that's a, the location's perfect for the UPS box. I, I agree with you, yeah. and I would like to note that it is a UPS box, not a FedEx box. Some people are leaving FedEx boxes, yeah. <laughs> packages there, so. Yeah. No, thanks Hopefully for we can have one nearby. Yeah, but if we <laughs> can help you. on the FedEx front, let us know. All right, thank that you. That would be great because uh, here UPS is cutting back their services. It's yeah. hilarious. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Uh, we were going to have People Inc. next, uh, but uh, the gentleman got caught up in bad traffic on 81, so he's going to move on to next month. Uh, so now we can. Uh, Patrick Money, I believe I saw him come in with Rappahannock Rapid and Regional Commission update and a regional housing study presentation. Thank you, Chair Donahue, members of the Board of Supervisors. Um, Patrick Monty with the Rappahannock Rapid Ann Regional Commission. Um, I have a lot of slides, and then I talked to Mr. Curry, and he said, we we'll probably keep it to a certain amount. And so um, you've got the slides. I'm going to go through them, but I would also um, encourage you, if there's questions afterwards, I tend to be data heavy, and that's what's uh, represented there. Um, 
Before I jump into the housing piece, I did want to let you all know you'll probably see an email within the next week um, seeking input on what the commission is working on, what our priorities and focus areas should be, um, not just for the next fiscal year, but into the future. Um, I'd appreciate any time that you can spend um, going through that and, and giving us that feedback so that if there are things we're not working on that we should be working on or things that we're working on that you think we shouldn't be working on, um, that we have that information. Um, you running the slides, Mr. Yes, Curry? I'm good. Okay. So, again, this is a little bit um, based on a housing study that the Regional Commission did in 2021, um, 2020, 2021, um, but also will give some background into our work um, around housing um, in the region. So you can see there, our involvement uh, primarily has been um, for the past 12, 13 years as lead agency for Foothills Housing Network. That's the regional continuum of care for homeless, uh, homeless services coordination. Um, we took that on, um, again, because there were changes at the federal level and the state level in terms of how funding was allocated and needing to have a regional response system. Prior to that, there were individual shelters and, and service providers that got funding uh, for homeless services. Um, it, so when, when that change occurred, the Regional Commission was asked to take on that role, and, and we accepted and have continued in that role for a dozen years. Um, I will note that uh, Ms. Crooks and the Department of Social Services are a partner with us on Foothills Housing Network, and a lot of the nonprofits that serve uh, Rappahannock County are also partners there as well. The housing study, which I'll talk a little bit more about, and also the PDC Affordable Housing Program, uh, which is ongoing, and that was funding that we received, as well as the other 20 uh, regional commissions across the state from Virginia Housing to support construction of uh, affordable housing units. Uh, we're currently in the last year and a half of that grant, um, and we'll, in the, the four years that we'll have had that grant, we'll have um, ended up assisting with the production of uh, over 100 units of affordable housing um, across the region. Just want to say real quickly the presentations attached to the agenda in board docs and these blue items are linkable to the work product so yes chase this down afterwards <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah next slide thank you so again for foothills housing network um there is sometimes some confusion foothills housing network is not an entity it is all mm -hmm. sorts of entities including the regional commission including uh, department of social services and other partners as well all working in that sphere um, to, to address uh, homeless services um, in the region. Um, limited, again, leveraging limited local funds and, and really to ensure that state and federal resources are able to come in to provide some assistance uh, in, in those areas. Next slide, please. And so this just gives a little bit more information on, on how to qualify. The, the funding programs that are available for Foothills Housing Network uh, for clients that would qualify, and this is for people with generally with incomes less than 30% of area median income. Um, there's homelessness prevention, which is not eviction prevention, but is for if you are literally going to be homeless. Um, there are various uh, barriers that you have to prove and or obstacles that you have to jump over and, and prove. And then rapid rehousing, which is for people that are literally homeless, um, either unsheltered, living in a shelter, um, or in what we've seen in the past couple of years, an increase in people that actually are living in their cars um, would also qualify. Next slide, please. The PDC Housing Development Program, this is the, the money that I mentioned from Virginia Housing. Um, it was provided to each of the, again, the regional commissions across the state. Um, on a per capita basis. So because of the population in our region of 185,000 or so, we qualified to uh, receive $2 million from Virginia Housing. Um, we developed an RFP process and, and sought partners that were interested that had projects that they were looking to, to design or construct in the region. Um, that was in January of 2022 um, and received seven applications. Uh, we've since moved forward with, with five projects in three counties. So we've got um, two projects in, in Fauquier County, one in the town of Warrington, two in the town of Culpeper, and one project in, in Madison in the town um, with those partners. And as you can see, there are 113 units that will be developed. Um, the picture there on the bottom left is, uh, was the former, it was a transitional housing um, shelter in Madison um, that was uh, operated by Madison Emergency Services Association had been vacant and unused for about three to four years. Um, Skyline Community Action Partnership purchased that building with, with some of the funds that we provided to them and renovated um, and, and took the existing five units and, and added a sixth um, unit in that spot. Um, the, the main point I make about this program is that we don't have, from the regional commission perspective, we don't have a, a top-down approach of it needs to look like this or we need to have this many units. Um, for that $2 million, what we agreed to with Virginia Housing was we'd produce 20 units. Um, our goal was, was more than that, but we didn't want to say it needs to look like this or 
we need to have um, you know low income housing tax credit projects that would be acceptable in the town of Culpeper and put those in the town of Madison or, or somewhere else. Is a project, sorry to interrupt, is a project in Warrington, the uh, Ben and Mary Steakhouse property, is that? So that's in that's in the county, in Fauquier County. That was one that we funded also okay. um, for them to do that, that, for Foothills Housing Corporation to do that adaptive reuse. In Warrington, it's working with Fauquier Habitat in the Haytai Street neighborhood. That's for, really turned out beautifully, and we talked about it briefly here because it's a great example of repurposing something instead of building something new, which right. I think certainly fits sort of the ethic here in Rappanic County. Well, I appreciate that, uh, Supervisor Whitson. And I think the the five projects that we have, the two that are large projects that are producing the majority of that 113 are in, are in the town of Culpeper. So there's a 60-unit, um, actually People Incorporated is the partner there that's building a 60-unit uh, apartment building. And Culpeper Community Development Corporation is doing a 37-unit. The other ones are the, the one I mentioned there in Madison, the one you mentioned, Ben and Mary's, and then uh, Vauquier Habitat in an existing neighborhood in town. And so it's very much what's appropriate within the context of the situation with what we wanted to support. Okay. Next slide, please. So this is just a, a slide that I include for, for any presentation on the housing study or related to housing. And it really just talks about the importance of, of housing as a social determinant of health. It's an important aspect um, beyond just having shelter and a roof over one's head. Um, as all of you know, um, housing is complex. There's solutions that you know, can address some of the short-term needs, such as emergency shelter, that can conflict with long-term needs in terms of the time it takes to, to get housing approved and to get um, housing constructed. Um, I think one thing that I would mention, the recent articles in the Rappanic News, also in the Fauquier paper and in the Culpeper paper, um, the external factors, and I'll get into some of those here, but there are a lot of external factors that are not of the control of a regional organization or a local government um, that impact housing, and that, that makes it not a static market. It's something that's constantly changing, and the idea of how do we know when we've done enough to you know, address affordable housing? It's not really a question that, that can be answered. It's something that's consistently consistently changing and shifting. Next slide, please. All right, so some of the challenges noted, um, and I'll hit the, the bold ones because that sort of guides the rest of the presentation. Um, housing availability and supply, and this was something that we, we looked at during the housing study that I'll talk a little bit more about. Um, as I mentioned, the housing study was, was adopted or approved by the commission in 2021. That's three years ago, so we've been periodically gathering new data and, and augmenting what was collected then, um, which I'll share here. Um, it, the second bullet point there, <coughs> lack of rental units, that is an impact across all five of our counties. And, and frankly, you know, statewide, nationwide, in terms of availability of rental units. Um, it's not so much a, you know, there's, there's, it's a supply issue, but it, there's multiple causes. I reference short-term rental, but there's also just a, a lack of, of available units in general. Um, defining affordable housing and measuring outcomes. So as soon as I say the word affordable housing, everyone in this room probably has a different connotation of what that means. So what's affordable? Who are we trying to serve? Um, that's not a criticism. It's not a, you know, anybody's right or wrong. It's just a fact that it's, you can't say that or, you know, whatever adjective you want to throw in front of housing and have everybody on the same page. So it's a continuing discussion. Um, again, that second bullet point under that one, it, in different parts of the state, the nation, you know, even in our region, the role of public, private, nonprofit chain uh, varies quite greatly. Um, I think the, the five projects that we're working with uh, exemplify that as well in terms of what uh, makes sense in, in different areas. And then again, um, something we'll go into with the data is disparities in renters versus owners. Um, that's only been, um, you know, increased in terms of the disparities because of changes in mortgage rates and because of uh, cost of housing um, overall. Next slide, please. So I don't think any of this will be um, new for any of you or, or, or maybe not um, based on your other work that you've done, but you know, the, the region is expected over the next you know, 10 to 20 years to see steady population growth. That population growth is predominantly expected in three counties, so Culpeper, Fauquier, and Orange. Um, we have an aging population um, across the region, even for those, those growing counties where there's projected growth. Um, in terms of housing, the highest demand is for those age 65 plus. Um, we did see some in the housing study between uh, the ages of 35 and 44. Some of that could be accomplished and accommodated by um, turnover of housing, but that's where we see the, the biggest need on the, on the aging population. Um, the region's also growing in population, as I said, 
but most of that population growth, especially over the last you know, three to, to five years, has been on in-migration rather than natural increase. So pretty much every county in the region is you know, at best static in terms of natural increase, in terms of births minus deaths. Um, so where the population is, is, is increasing is coming from you know, outside the region, people moving into the region. And then I'll, I'll briefly mention the underhoused population. This was something that we developed as part of the housing study. Um, this is meant to capture the individuals that are, as it says, they're aged 18 to 34 that are living with somebody that's not a spouse. So either living with parents or multiple roommates um, who in an ideal world may prefer to live in their own, their own unit. Next slide, please. This just um, exemplifies what I mentioned just a, a second ago about the in-migration. So you can see every single county in our five-county region um, in the 2020 to 2023 um, has increased based on this is migration uh, changes only, so in-migration. So uh, Fauquier has grown between 0 and 2% in those three years, Rappahannock, Culpeper, and Madison um, between 2 and 4% based on migration, and Orange County uh, over 4% uh, based on migration. That's not to say that Rappahannock or you know, Madison or, or Culpeper are growing at that rate because, again, the, the natural increase is actually lower. Um, you're, you're having uh, more deaths than, than births um, in several of our counties, so that the overall growth rate is a little bit less than some of these. Again, um, what I like about this slide, and this comes from the housing study and I think has continued to hold true, is that the region is aging. Um, what you see there, and if you can, the, the blue bar is the region's population, the, the percentage of uh, within that age range. And so you see we kind of peak in the 50 to 54, 55 to 59, thank you, 60 to 64. The, it doesn't really show up great, but there's a green and then a, a gray um, circle. And so the green is Virginia and the gray is U.S. And so really what you see there is from about age 15 to 19 all the way up to 40 to 44, um, the region trails in terms of what percentage of the population um, on that younger side. And then again, once you get over age 50, the region exceeds both the Virginia and U.S. averages um, overall. Uh, median age, and again, just to exemplify the, the, where we see the greatest need in terms of some of the housing, um, overall, again, we exceed Virginia and U.S., um, the only county that uh, is lower than the regional average is Culpeper, um, but they're all um, over 39 in terms of the median age, 2022. Next slide. 50.9. So here's population trends for, for Rappahannock County based on some of the, the most recent American Community Survey data. I, I'm not gonna do a deep dive into the American Community Survey. There are issues with um, overall the um, you know, margins of error and things like that, but from a trend line perspective, that's, that's really what it's presented for. Um, this actually reads right to left, so if you're looking, 2018 is on the right to 2022 on the left, but what that shows is uh, population Roughly, you know, pretty stable in terms of just over 7,000 um, households decreasing in that time. Um, and then so that means people per household getting larger. Um, what that would tell us is that we're seeing, you know, some households moving out and then households that are, you know, potentially moving in um, being a little bit uh, higher in terms of uh, population. Um, it also, you know, kind of gets into the idea of where does that housing go if we, if we have, if we've seen households moving out, why are we still seeing issues with supply of household, of housing? Some of that is by people, you know, buying in, moving, buying a second house or changing a, a rental house to a short term rental, um, something along those lines. <coughs> All right, again, uh, population trends, and, and really I think the, the pieces to point out here are um, the growth in um, 344 of the, the overall households that consist of uh, one person. So let me start over again. 668 households consist of, of one person. That's about a quarter of all households in, in the county. Um, about half of those households were seniors 65 years or older living alone, so about 50% of the, the one-person households, and that number has increased um, year over year since 2019. So again, aging population, an aging population that's wanting to age in place and, and, live, and will live by themselves if, if that opportunity presents themselves, 
but that has all of the other things that come with it in terms of what, what services need to be provided, how you assist those individuals and those households wanting to age in place, um, and, and what other things they might need in terms of housing repair, things of that nature. All right, so real estate trends in construction activity and permitting. Um, I think what we would see here, and um, you can just sort of scroll through if you want, Gary, I think most of these are, are going to be um, pretty standard in terms of the housing type. We have a fairly homogenous housing type in the region, um, over 84% um, single-family homes detached. Um, the next highest is when single-family units attached, which is about 5%. And then you've got units, um, you know, two units, duplexes, you know, triplexes, and up to up to apartment buildings. But generally, the development patterns in this region have been have been homogenous for decades. For uh, Rappahannock County, and again, this gets into the um, housing and household comparison. Um, and again, I, I, I couch that with its American Community Survey data, but the trends are there that show we've seen housing unit that trended up a little bit for two years between 2018 and 2020 and then declined between 2020 and 22. Um, we saw that decline in, in total households overall um, despite there being a, a slight increase in population. The biggest thing that I would say is the, the vacant housing units um, increased by 23 units between 2018 and 2022. 23 units is not a lot but there's also that's also starting from a, a fairly small floor in terms of total number of units. We can't ascribe all of that to, um, again, second home purchases and people that don't make Rappahannock County or other parts of the region their primary residence. Um, but that's definitely a, a potential reason for that. The other piece would be short-term rentals <clears throat> potentially being um, you know, converted from a, a long-term rental to a short-term rental. As I recall, when the consultant was working on it, this metric is a bit of an outlier for the, the amount of vacant Right, second home. So I think it might be on the next okay. slide. There's another. Um, yeah. Yes. So <laughs> we we phrased it in such a way that Rappahannock County has maintained the highest percentage of vacant housing units at approximately 26 percent. I asked staff that was pulling this number together. Well, you know, what does that look like compared to other counties in the region? Madison is generally the second highest, and it's usually about half of that number, 13 to 14 percent. Um, so there's a, a much higher you know vacant vacancy rate here. Ms. Bonnie, can I ask one real quick? Sure. Question? Would that be less than 180 days in the house? Or what, how, what was that? It, generally, yes. It's, I mean, if you're filling out this information for a community survey, you're saying primary residence is here. And so, yes, it would be more than, you know, wherever you're living primarily. It's probably left to the, the responder on what they deem their primary. It, it's, yeah, I mean, it's voluntary. I mean, you know, unless the census is going to come out and knock on your door and continue to pester you, I don't think that's happening. But yeah, the information is voluntarily provided um, and sampled. But you, you can see it's way bigger than our typical community. Patrick, um, I can't see the data real clearly just on the screen, but I recall between our last two, last two census, um, data collection exercises tell me if this if this dovetails with your own data but i recall hearing that between the two 10-year census surveys we lost something like 18 housing units in the county and i think people need to keep in perspective like you were just saying we're talking wrapping in county numbers right i mean we're talking tiny numbers so over a 10-year period i don't know houses you know, abandoned farmhouses maybe were burned down or torn down or something like that. Is that, is that number kind of in line with? I, I mean, I think that, again, I think it was 23 over the four years. I, I okay. think that makes sense to me. Um, I, I would say the, you know, again, the decennial census is single count, you know, and it, it, again, they're not coming out and how do you determine what's a, a housing unit if you're doing a, a windshield survey even. So I think that does make sense to me. Um, you know, I would be more concerned if it was saying, oh, we've seen a, a massive increase. Right. Because where would, where would be the data to back that up that, that something like that would change? Yeah, but I mean, if, if for example, this Rush River Commons project here in the town of Washington is going to be adding 18 housing units, which basically offsets a loss over a 10-year period. Right. In, I mean, in order to address whatever uh, decline in housing stocks uh, might be occurring in our community, the, the replacement of those units does not require a, a great expansive Clevenger's Corner type effort is kind of where I'm going. 
we're talking incremental incremental addition of housing stocks and we're basically looking at zero population growth over like a hundred year period we don't need a whole lot would you i i would agree with that in a yeah in a rapid handed county discussion yes yep thank you sure this just gives um, units permitted and really what, not so much for Rappahannock County, but for the region as a whole, the, the point of these two charts is to show you that from 2000 to 2018, there was, um, you know, that number of units, but you saw, especially in, in Culpeper, um, a little bit in orange, um, structures that were not just single family units that were, were permitted. What we saw between 2008 and 2018, which is the bottom chart, is those, you know, bottom three um, lines, duplexes, structures of three and four units, structures of five units were much lower. So once the housing market crash and, and the construction crash in, in the mid 2000s, um, again, we saw that largely homogenous, um, what, was, what was permitted and what frankly was, was feasible for uh, to be constructed. Do you recall offhand um, the percentage of the regional population in Rappahannock County? Um, I'm trying to do the math. Oh, um, I thought you might know it from our No, I think it's, share. I was going to say, I think it's about 5%. Yeah. I would suspect that our contribution to the houses built would be less than our proportionate share of people. I would, I would think so. And again, this is permits rather than, I mean, building permits rather than, um, you know, habitable houses, but yeah. Okay. This is showing sort of the same thing um, for uh, the, the region. Um, we've got permits, um, units, and then household comparison. So the, the change in units is in the blue, the total permits issued, and this is 2017 to 2021-ish. Um, so you can see permits is a little bit higher in most counties than the change in the total housing units, and then you can see the total households. Um, what that tells us, and especially if you look at the regional chart on the right side, is that, again, a number of permits issued it doesn't mean that the house is, is completely you know livable and constructed and complete but the permits been issued to build total housing units is, is less than that so we haven't seen everything get constructed but the number of households has increased so if you look at the household the region numbers it's about 2700 in housing units and the number of households has increased by about 3700 so we've seen a population growth a household growth we haven't seen the units keep up with that, which again puts more pressure on, you know, cost and, and availability of, of supply of, of housing units. And back to Mr. Whitson's point, we've seen a decrease. Yes. Yep. All right. So vacancy rate, and this is um, sort of gets into a little bit about the the rental market. Um, when you when you look at the owner vacancy rate versus the renter vacancy rate um, across the the region. At below three, um, or excuse me, at or above five is considered a healthy market. You've got enough supply, you've got turnover mm -hmm. happening. Um, below three indicates um, additional units needed to meet, uh, to meet the demand uh, and to have a healthy market. You can generally see that it's, you know, largely across the region, we're, we're largely in that below three area. Um, none of them, with the exception of Gordonsville on the owner side, has over, over five mm -hmm. um, in terms of that, that measurement. Uh, you can skip this one because I did not delete the second second time I had that slide in. <laughs> um, owners and renters. So this gets back to the, the third bullet point that I talked about, the disparities and, and impacts on owners and renters. Um, again, that vacancy, that vacant housing rate is important. Um, you can see for, for Rappahannock, it's largely, you know, owner, and this is the same for across the region, um, largely owner-occupied, smaller amount of renter-occupied, and then vacant housing units, which you can see that vacancy number um, taking up a pretty significant amount um, of the of the total housing unit. The other thing I would say on this slide is the the variability of the data, but largely has has seen an increase in total units, mostly driven by owner occupied uh, housing. So some of those external um, effects. These are this is from actually the annual meeting that we had last October. Um, we had a speaker from Virginia Realtors, just walking through. Here's how mortgage rates have changed. And, and really, the, the, on the right side, the gap um, in between what most people that, that have a pre-2022, you know, early 2023 mortgage rate versus those that, that don't have one of those, and the impacts on not seeing uh, home ownership uh, houses turnover because people say, I've got a 3.5% or a 3% mortgage rate. I'm not going to better myself by going out and get a 7% mortgage rate, even if the house is um, larger. 
median sales prices, and this actually, um, I was at a presentation a week and a half ago um, from Greater Piedmont Realtors. They had a speaker from uh, the multi-listing service, and all of these numbers are, you know, are the same. We're seeing cost increase uh, or price increases for median sales across the region, um, and that's been a, a standard thing for even back before this, these charts start in 2019. These are August, or excuse me, this is January to August of, of last year, again, pulling from the, the presentation we had at our annual meeting. Um, what's important to note here is the number on the right, the, the, what actually happened, um, and this is backed up by the presentation from multi-listing service representative a couple weeks ago. The number of houses that are, are selling is the lowest it's been in 20 years in terms of total number of transactions for uh, housing. So inventory is really low. When inventory is low, that tends to drive prices up on, on the ownership side. <clears throat> All right, so on housing demand from the housing study, um, one of the things we found was for the region, and this was over a five to 10 year period beyond when the housing study was completed, so roughly the 2020s, we found that there would be a demand for housing across income levels. So not just housing for individuals at 50% AMI or below, but also individuals that want to move to the region at a 200% AMI or above. So we have people with a lot of money that want to move here. We have people that live here or may want to move here as well with, with not as much money that still would need that, that housing and would demand that housing and, and impact the, the existing housing that would be available. A couple of those bullet points, and again from the, the presentation from multi-listing service, and this is impacting on not just our region, but especially in adjacent areas. So Loudoun County um, was one that she cited. There's a growing number of, of cash sales. So individuals that are bringing cash to just purchase, you know, without a mortgage um, because rates have increased and 1 million plus sales. So we've seen on that higher income level, you know, prices have increased, values have increased on housing, but also people that are willing to come in and buy, whether they're making that their primary residence or not. Um, using cash and, and you know, at the, at the, the higher level uh, in terms of value. For owner and renter, um, again, I think kind of sound like a broken record, but both markets are very tight currently. Low vacancy rate, low turnover um, means that there's not a lot of options out there. Um, for Rappahannock County, again, I'll, I'll underline the, the second home impact, short-term rentals, and just the overall impact on supply. Um, it's easy to think in for me in terms of a Rappahannock Rapidan region, for you all in terms of a Rappahannock County, but you know, the housing market doesn't look at, it's sort of like an economic development or anybody else. It's not, we're not gonna look at jurisdictional boundaries. It's what's available in terms of a, a larger area. Um, cost burdened households, those are people spending 30% plus of their income on housing expenses. So that's not just rent and mortgage, but also utilities and, and things of that nature. Generally higher amongst renting households. So that's a, a larger impact on, on renter households. Next slide, please. This just reflects what I was just saying about we've seen a demand from those in blue, which is population change, largely based on in-migration, um, would be the demand across um, income levels. So at that over 200 AMI, um, you know, demand for about 300 units. And then as you get down below 80% AMI, you see the demand not just amongst population change, but also the underhoused population and, and people that are not in um, the type of, of housing that they would they would like to be in um, or could afford. So this reflects the uh, median income for again owner occupied and, and renting households as of 2021. You can see for uh, homeowners the on the above the line um, median income, and that spans from 134,181 in, in Vauquier County to 61,000 in, in Remington. Rappahannock is roughly in the middle at about 96,000 um, for median income for homeowners. On the rental side, um, you can see that it's below that. So in the town of Culpeper, it's about 57,000 um, in terms of the median income for renters. Madison County, a little bit below 40,000. I think that just shows, you know, again, the buying power. If you're a homeowner, you, you've got some of that rental. You don't have as much. And again, the prices are, are even more squeezed at this point. Again, here's the, the cost burden. So that 30% or more of their income going towards housing costs and the disproportionate impact on the lowest income under 50% AMI um, and then 50 to 80% AMI. Um, Again, heavier, heavier on renters um, in terms of the, the percentage on the lowest side. 
And again, this reflects the, you know, sort of the, the median point there, just about 50,000 um, in terms of who's, who's spending that, um, that percentage in terms of what they're, they're spending. So for homeowners, you're spending typically more of, um, more of your income on, um, as, the, as your income exceeds, and on the renter side, it, it drops down um, at that 50,000 to 74,000 uh, piece as well. This just kind of updates that cost burden data. Again, I would say it's this reflects best the impact on renters. So the red is renters, the blue is, is homeowners, and for Rappahannock County on the right side, about 41.6% of renters are cost burdened, 21.4% of homeowners, and this is 2018 data from Housing Forward Virginia. All right. Two slides left. So the change here, and this is on the renter occupied, and really what we included this slide was to show the impact in terms of the available units. So between 2018 and 2022, um, there was a decrease in about 45 rentals in Rappahannock County. So basically all of them that were under $500 a month. So what's that, what's that telling us is 2018, there were 45 rentals at $500 a month or less. Now there are zero. And again, data being what it is, but I think the trend is, is pretty clear. Um, 21 rentals between 500, a, a net loss of 21 rentals of units between 500 and $1,000, net loss of 94 rentals for units between 1,000 and 1,500, and then an increase of those at or above uh, 2,000. So again, Price is going up, what that means for citizen, average citizen that, that's renting um, in Rapana County. And again, the right side shows that that's not uncommon for the region. Rapana County is roughly in the middle for most of our, our region um, based on that, uh, with only three of three of the jurisdictions showing a, an average that actually decreased. But on net, 30 or so rentals just gone. Based on those numbers, yep. So here's the, just the data sources. Again, as Mr. Curry said, there's a lot of clickable links in there. I'm always happy to, to talk more about this. And, and when, when he asked me, I, the housing study, like I said, is, is three years old, so we've supplemented with some additional data. But as I would also say, this is an ongoing conversation that is, you know, I could come back next month and have something not totally different, but just something new um, to talk through. So I'm happy to answer additional questions if you have them or um, any other thoughts. Mr. Monty, thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, there's a lot there to chew on and to think about. Um, thanks for putting it together in a way that's kind of digestible. I know that there's more I can get into once I click through the links. Sure. Um, but thank you. I, 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 would, I would be interested in a, in a quarterly or something, maybe biennial update. I mean, you guys are constantly doing work and coming up with new numbers. So. I'm absolutely interested. I'm, I'm happy to, to do that. I'm happy to come out quarterly just on commission quarterly update. If that makes sense, that's always an, an option as well because we're doing, not to take too much more time, we're doing a lot of stuff, um, and housing and, and not just not just housing as well. So I'm happy to, well, to do that. Also keeping up to date on it, you know, is probably more effective too than just giving us this, this huge chunk once a year or whatever it could be. And I would say that the housing study in 2021, I think, you know, and we sort of, you, you finish a study and it's like, okay, let, let's take a breath. I think we realized within a year, okay, we have, to, we have to do something where we're continuing to collect this data, continue to update, maybe not the exact data that's in the study, but useful data that, that can be used by, you know, local governments, by ourselves for um, making a case for, for whatever the need might be. So, thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Patrick, for You're welcome. coming out today. Thanks. I really do applaud you continuing to keep those numbers because especially it seems like with the influx of people uh, during COVID out to the countryside, I think it is a continuously moving target. So right. um, anything you can do to help keep us informed is much appreciated. Sure, you're welcome. Thank you. Patrick, will you remind me on the, um, because numbers, small ones even make a difference here, we know we have somewhere between 40 and 70, I don't know what the actual number is, of um, tourist homes. And I don't remember in these slides how a tourist home is counted mm -hmm. if the owner stays in it part of the year or even not. Again, if it's, you know, some of it's re rely on the person reporting. So if they, if they stay in it, and to Mr. Carney's point, if they're there eight months out of the year and rent it four months, 
then they would probably count as a, a resident, so it wouldn't show up as a, a short-term rental or a tourist home. If they're there, you know, one month or on weekends, then it probably would show up in, in that regard. And, and so with the ACS data, that sort of shows up with the, the vacant housing, if it's a second home or a place that's not habit, hab, that they're not inhabiting a majority of the year. We have a lot of second homes, uh, which is affecting that vacant number, right. and then a fair number of these, I guess, a second home by ownership status, but they probably don't live there or maybe visit once a year, and then they rent it out short-term basis mm -hmm. to remain flexible, so they can go there a couple right. a couple weekends a year. And I think I think those would show up in you know, that instance would show up in the vacancy rate. All right, cool. Thank, Thank you Thank so you. very much. Thank Appreciate you. your time. <clears throat> All right. Next, we have uh, Meridian Financial Partners. It's a new local business, and I think we have Nathan Gilbert. Yes. All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name's Nathan Gilbert. I'm with Meridian Financial Partners. Uh, we are a new business on 211 Main Street uh, in the Miller Building, if you're familiar. Um, I don't think we rank in uh, the housing conversation or the library, but I appreciate the time nonetheless. Um, we are, uh, I have my partner Sarah Yakel here before I forget to introduce her. Um, we are an investment management and financial planning firm. Uh, we are, our main office is in Warrenton, Virginia. And in response to some clients that we have out this way who encouraged us to have a presence out here, it seems that what we can offer might be a need in the community and we certainly hope that is the case. Um, we are proud to be uh, independent, a uh, fee only, and a fiduciary, which we feel um, eliminates a lot of the uh, confusion that comes with how do I pay for investment and financial planning uh, services. So our hope is to take some of that confusion away and um, you know add value to not only your financial plan but also to uh, growing your money. Um, we currently serve over 400 households, and we manage uh, a little over $420 million. We're, we're very proud of that in our world. That's still relatively small, and we kind of like it that way. Um, so again, we by having a physical presence here, and our hope is to become more a part of the, the community than we already are, um, we welcome you to stop by. We are trying to have uh, at least one person in that office uh, from 9 to 2 every day. Um, we're pulled away into meetings such as these from time to time. We do welcome a call or a visit to our website to set up some time. Um, you know, that, that conversation is free of charge and sometimes it's multiple conversations. Our goal would be to give you and, and, and share enough information to help you sort of make a, a good financial decision or decisions. Um, I don't think I have much more to that to add there. I don't want, don't want to take up anyone's time unnecessarily, but I welcome questions from, from you all. Well, it's great. And uh, welcome to the community. And Thank you. Um, I know Mr. Leek introduced uh, uh, Debbie Donahue and I to you. And um, it is funny. We were joking that you've turned Main Street, Washington to Wall Street with, there you go. with Oakview Bank. And now you're your firm right there. So um, small scale, but we'll take it. We'll take and, it. Yeah. And it's, it's just, it's great to have a new business. And um, if there's anything we can ever do in county government to help you, uh, let us know. Are well, you are you still having a? Uh, yeah. Okay. This, but, but I think I know where you're going. Thank yeah. you. I, I, that was on my mind to to mention. Um, we do. We, we're not having an official sort of grand opening, mainly due to space constraints. But we, as we do in our Warrenton office, we're going to have a a shred and a food truck on April Thursday, April 26th. Um, that's open to the community. We're gonna we're gonna put that. Uh, in the Rappahannock News here shortly, so hopefully keep an eye out for that. That's open to everybody. Um, lunch is on us. It is a secure on-site shredding, so we try to put it around tax time. We figure that's a popular time to be emptying some <laughs> some shred items. Um, but we'll have our whole group there. Um, if you'd like to say hello, um, we, we welcome you to, to come by. Um, so yeah, thank you for the reminder there. Great. Thanks a lot. Right. Thank, Thank you very you much. Very Appreciate good. it. Thanks for coming in. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Um, next, we're going into public comment. 
Anyone wishing to speak, please be recognized. And when you come up to the microphone, give us your name and your district. Somebody taller than me. Hi, I'm Steph Ritter. I'm from the Wakefield District. And I know you're going to do this later, but I just wanted to add my voice to thanking Eve Brooks for the amazing contributions that she's made to the county and especially, especially to Encompass over the years. When you think of her extraordinary service in representing the vulnerable people, especially people with mental health issues and, uh, and my favorite school children, uh, it's, it's been, we've been so lucky to have her. And I, I can't tell you how many boards I've served on <laughs> Uh, with Eve and what a pleasure it is and how honored I am that she chose Rappahannock to live in and to make all her contributions. Then I did, I did want to add one other thing. I, I know Mr. Witz, uh, Whitson keeps referring to the 18 houses uh, that got burned down, I believe, on Eldon Farm. And I myself was in one of those houses when the second floor collapsed and my daughter fell to the ground. and. I'm, I'm telling you, they may have been affordable, but they were not safe. So uh, when you think about replacement of the housing, and I, there's not a day that goes by when I don't hear from somebody, either teachers or elderly people, that there is no housing available for them. So please, please keep that in mind. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Tommy Atkins, and I'm not sure which district I'm with. Some people say I'm from the Piedmont, not, but I don't. I do know I'm from the Jackson district. So we'll just set the record straight. I am from the Jackson district. I have a couple things. One on, and I don't like the word terminology of affordable because that's all over the place. You know, it takes two to tango. When you've got somebody who wants to buy something, they and you have someone that wants to sell something. Both have got to do some compromise. You can't have it one way. So that, that, there has to be some compromise. And yes, I'm old school. I was born in a time when you had to be totally conservative in order to survive. And I know most of you do not want to hear the word conservative anymore. That's out the window. But we are back, whether you want to admit it or not, we are in a time where you've got to be conservative in order to get some of these housing needs taken care of. Now, and I'll just throw out a couple things. You may not, if you're, the, if you're wanting to buy and you need a house, you may not be able to have the big super duty pickup, the Cadillac Escalade in your driveway. You may not be able to eat at the end every month. You may not be able to eat at Longhorn twice, once once a week or so forth. You may have to tighten that belt. I had to do it when I was coming along. I had to tighten that belt in order to get what I wanted. But God blessed me greatly, and I was able to get what I wanted. But I got, I was blessed. And it can still be done today. Rappahannock, as we all know, is a unique county. The people in it are unique. Now, we've got, yes, Government assistance is great, but not everybody is in this ball game looking for government assistance. We've got a lot of people, and I don't know the number, but we've got people in this county that wants a chance to have a house, to have a rent. They just want a chance. And you people are in the position that you can help that chance. And I'm just going to throw out a couple things with that. Acreage. Oh, boy, I can hear people back here. Oh, boy. We've got, we got uh, Clevenger's Corner coming on in Rappahannock. That'll never happen. For any of you that think that, you're dreaming. It can never happen in Rappahannock County. But uh, I know I'm getting off subject a little bit, but Clevenger's Corner does have three things coming that Rappahannock County 
desperate needs. They have an urgent care coming. They have a, they have a pharmacy, and they have a food store. We need those three items in the middle of Rappahannock County so that we don't have to go to Warrington, Front Row, Culpeper, or Luray to get immediate care, urgent care, or to get, get our groceries, or to get our, get our medical needs. We need that in the middle of this county. Now, let's get back to what you can do, all right? Our comprehensive plan said our density needs to be in and around the village. It's in and around the village. Spurville, for one, has some small acreage lots that can be built on. Instead of you, us requiring them to be one acre lot, they could be cut into one half acre lot. So there's two houses could be built on, on the, that acre. So that's not a big dent. But some of us are in a position that we can do that. But you have got to help us in order to be able to do that. Now, I know you're looking at me like, well, but I'm telling you, I know for a fact, I'm one of those that do own some, some fall acreage lots in Spurville. And I am willing to put it up, but you are going to have to give us a little bit. This is where the, the seller has to have some concessions made to where, the, yes, I'm not looking for government assistance. Let's get that clear right now. I'm not looking for no government assistance, but I am in a position that I can provide some housing needs. And I know there are some housing needs. That I'm already, I'll toot my own horn a little bit here. I'm already providing some housing needs. I own a, my wife and I own an apartment house right here on Main Street. Currently, we have a school teacher renting one of those apartments. We have a elderly woman that had the downside, and, she, and she's living in one of our apartments. I have two young ladies that want to reside in the county. They're working out of the county, but we're renting to two of those. So I'm telling you, there's, I'm not the only one. There are others that can do more, and it will help you. But you people, the buck stops with y'all, so y'all can, can help us. And I'm asking you to give that consideration. And one other thing, I'm going to go back to the budget. I want to go back to the budget. I heard what you, what you said, and I appreciate that. Now, when we come down to our children in school, we want them to see that they get everything that they need. But we want it to be provided efficiently. Now, I ask you to also take in consideration us elderly people and all us taxpayers that are facing a tax increase in order to fund some of these budgets. Now, some of these elderly people, they're, they're working on shoestring budgets. The same expenses that the schools are going through, we're going through them as well. Our fuel our fuel price goes up, our food price goes up, our housing needs goes up, everything is going up. So have some consideration. And I know you, I think you didn't raise the tax rate last year, but some of us got hit with the tax increase because of the reassessment. I was one of those, and I know there were several others. So please have some consideration for our taxpayers that you don't keep on and I know you're doing your best, but don't break our back. We've been carrying this county for a long, long time. But please give us some consideration. Thank you. Thanks, Tommy. Thank you, Tommy. Thank you, Tommy. Thanks, Tommy. Hi, I'm Mark Anderson for the Piedmont District. Sadly, I don't have any graphics, <laughs> and I don't have a lot of statistics. I have about three or four, which I'll repeat. Uh, I'm here to talk today about recent activities of the Lions Club of Rappahannock County, which I've been proud to be a member of for the last two years. Uh, R Roger Welch used to update you all. As you probably know, he was one of the founders or early members of the 
Rappahannock Club, which is over 50 years old today. Uh, sadly, he can't do this, so I'm going to try uh, to fill his shoes. The Lions Club is entirely a service organization. Our motto and our mission statement is, we serve. And that's all that we do in this county, almost 50 members, but we interact with hundreds of other volunteers. As you know, the county is totally dependent on volunteers for a lot of uh, social service functions that bigger counties would hire government bureaucrats to do. We can't do that, so we just organize people and get it done ourselves. Uh, we were founded in 1917. There are almost uh, 1.4 million members worldwide today in the Lions. Here in this county, we have almost 50 members, 40 plus active. Um, Helen Keller, in 1925, charged the Lions with uh, focusing on sight and hearing conservation as one of its missions. And we still do that here today. We have machines we take to the uh, preschools and lower grades and test all the children for vision and hearing, and bring it to the attention of the nurse if there needs to be any further follow-up. It's all done at no cost. Uh, I'm gonna give you four bullets on four programs we're working on right now. And I'll come back in a few months and give you more if nobody squelches me. Uh, the first one is the plastic bag collection. This board voted in September of 21 to support the taking of plastic bags at the two recycling centers and putting them at a separate location. Yeah. And that has worked remarkably well, in my view. Uh, to date, we've collected over 14,000 pounds of these bags. That's seven tons for the mathematically challenged. That's a lot of bags. That's seven, that's seven tons of bags that are not in the landfill for the next few thousand years or blowing around our roads and highways. Mm -hmm. uh, the Lions collect these and take them to a manufacturer in Winchester who makes, right now, just park benches out of them and pays us in benches. So far, we have 28 of these benches, which we've donated to the county. Uh, I expected the courthouse to be chock-a-block with them, but I couldn't find one outside. So. <laughs> There are other public locations. One site I know we're working on for uh, spotting these benches is the uh, trail that goes out to Penn Druid along the Thornton River, which having walked that, I appreciate having a bench every now and again. <laughs> <laughs> so we're gonna carry on with that program and it's pretty well self-sustaining. The second bullet is the load closet for adult home health care. Uh, it's a lot bigger than a closet. It's really a double garage plus and it's chock-a-block with hospital beds, wheelchairs, walkers, and the ever-present electric scooters. It, these are available to people that need them for adult care, absolutely free, no cost. We provide the pickup and delivery services, and we maintain this, the equipment that's in this low closet. This is in conjunction with the Farm Bureau and the uh, Rapid Home Group. This is how we handle that. The third bullet is the Sperry Fest coming up April 27th. Uh, the same day, the Lions operate a uh, drug prescription turn-in with in conjunction with the Drug Administration, Drug Enforcement Administration. Uh, we're gonna try to combine the two and try to convince people to bring their prescription drugs with them to the Sperry Fest and then turn them in at the uh, Sperry Wolf uh, Rescue Station for the uh, drug prescription turn-in. So we'll see how that program works. And finally, I'll say scholarships. Uh, our primary uh, expenditure of funds we collect go for scholarships to students in this county. Uh, this past year, it was $16,000 in scholarships we gave out, which considering our fundraising is pretty good output. Uh, and I'm told to say, if the Piedmont Give program generates money for the Lions, all that money is gonna go into our scholarship program. Uh, coming up in May. We do four-year and two-year college programs, scholarships, plus trade schools, and we really emphasize great school, trade schools in the last several years. And that's all I have. If you'll tolerate me, I'll come back in several months with some more. Please do. Great, great Thank update. you. Yep. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> Anyone else public comment? Yes, ma'am. 
Hi, Gail Crooks, Director of Social Services for Rappahannock County, and I just wanted to alert everyone that April 1st starts Child Abuse Prevention Awareness Month, and we distributed pins to our board members last time, but come board member. <laughs> Thank you. So we hope you'll wear the pins proudly, and I hope our community will be on the lookout for our community pinwheel gardens that will be popping up at various community partners in different locations. Just as a reminder of all, all we can do as far as a community you know, to work together to prevent child abuse. And then it will be accumulating in a large garden, again, at Sperry Fest. And we invite everyone to come by our pinwheel garden on that day and pick a pinwheel and take it home with them. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Well, good afternoon. I'm Margaret Braun from the Piedmont District. Um, I want to have a few com give you a few comments on the post-mounted speed display sign that I just learned the term for. <laughs> Although I, uh, my experience has been over the last several weeks, the one that's uh, going into Sperryville as you're traveling down um, uh, 522. I, uh, as an aside, I, I understand that there are a number of others these post-mounted speed display signs, other parts of the county. I'm just most familiar with that one. And I expect my experience is the same uh, as with these other ones. But overall, I just wanted to, to uh, express my appreciation for having the sign where it is and what service it provides. It used to be when you drove into Sperryville um, from outside, uh, traveling uh, east, you'd sort of wait to see if you could see the sheriff's deputy parked in the Reynolds uh, Baptist Church parking lot before you started to slow down or not. So you'd hit the intersection at about 30, 35. The post-mounted speed display sign is very helpful to one get uh, one's attention a uh, much farther distance from the uh, main intersection and uh, downtown Sperryville. And what I appreciate is the, the, the numbers that down the um, speed as you decelerate, so you can you can judge just where you uh, need to be at the point that the uh, 25 mile per hour sign is without having to look constantly down at your speed speedometer and back up the road. So I think it's worked really well. And I notice other drivers, uh, the ones that I see ahead of me, as soon as the, the light starts to flash, I see their brake lights go on. So I know it's having an effect with others too. And as I say, the these uh, signs for other parts of the county are probably working just as well. So I really appreciate the, the efforts that Ms. Smith and, and Mr. Curry went to to get that uh, sign um, in the Sperryville region. And I, I'm sure that it's going to be helpful in the other parts of the county. And um, just kudos to you for a, a very positive uh, addition to our, our community. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you, Thank you Margaret. <clears throat> Sheila Gressinger, Hampton District. Um, I wanted to take a minute to um, address the presentation about the housing uh, situation that was uh, presented. Our, our comp plan describes us as an aging population. And with our superintendent, school superintendent, it's struggling really to maintain uh, a school population with numbers large enough to keep the school, getting school budget properly uh, addressed and everything. I, need, I think we need to take a different perspective of this aging population that's in our comp plan. Do we want to just settle for us being described as an aging population, or do we want to somehow participate in changing the dynamic? It, it's a complicated thing. It's how do we... Uh, attract young families, affordable housing, uh, which is a, a multi-structured uh, situation according to your income, but, but there are ways to do it. And I think we need to actively participate in being part of the solution rather than just settling as aging. I don't, I don't like it. I, I know we can do better, okay? Okay, the next thing, I want to talk about, I just want to do a reminder about the courthouse. I know that's on the uh, agenda every month now, and I'm hoping to be able to hear uh, how we're progressing, but according apparently to some state code, you need to talk to the participants who are act actually actively working 
in the courthouse, and I'm hoping that uh, the uh, whoever is working on this has uh, addressed the judges and the clerks who are actually working in the courthouse. You cannot just address a courthouse situation without addressing the needs and factual reports that they've already given us as to the situation that we're faced with. This courthouse is not safe and it's not secure. We have documentation from reports from judges and the sheriff and everything uh, about this. And I'm, I'm hoping that we go forward because they did stress the urgency of it that we don't want to wait until something happens. That's not, not really a good thing to do. Um, next thing is I want to talk about the Flint Hill Fire Department. I'm, I'm very happy to support everything they're doing going forward. I think there have been some unfortunate uh, stirring of a pot situation where um, people have been encouraged to seemingly not want to participate in, in going forward. And in my, in my opinion, um, I've told you before, when I go into a, a different industry, I've always looked for uh, the best information I could get, the best training I could get to be the best I could be. And one of the things that has always struck me is the fact of check your ego at the door. And I think there are some people who have not adhered to that, checking the ego at the door. We're working for the benefit of our entire county, and I think some innocent people uh, have been hurt by this, and I'm very disappointed, and I'm hoping that we can go forward in, in a positive way. Uh, the other thing I want to address quickly is um, participating in our county with communication. And I've said it before, we do have a wonderful gathering today because there are a lot of presentations that were taken care of. However, there are a lot of people, no, they're not. There are a few people who like to stir the pot and just be, in my opinion, obnoxious. And there are plenty of ways to communicate properly with our Board of Supervisors. We have the two o'clock meeting. Our board listened years ago and now have the 7 o'clock meeting, so people who are working can participate at 7 o'clock. We have the ability to do Zoom, so you can participate that way. If you are a techie, I'm not. Uh, and we also have the way of writing a letter. Gosh, if you don't have a computer, hand write the thing and send it snail mail to our board of supervisors. I'm sure they're more than happy to read it to read it into the record, and that's your way of communication. To the few who want to just be snarly on some of our online social things, my mother had a very gentle way of concluding the, the phrase, put up or, and she would say, ferme la bouche, which is a quiet way of saying, shut up. Be part of the situation or just leave it. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. I have something. I'm Sharon Luke in Piedmont District. Um, I noticed that you have a closed session on zoning today, and I'm hoping you'll consider whether that could possibly be open to the public. I know a lot of people are very interested in <clears throat> Chapter 170, the zoning ordinance. If, I believe you have that on for closed session today. So I wonder if you could consider whether that really needs to be in closed session or whether you could at least do most of it out in public. I don't know why it has to be closed. And I know it talked about legal matters, but it just said in general <clears throat> uh, amendments to chapter 170, of the, which is our whole zoning ordinance, so it's not specific whether what you're talking about. So would really appreciate maybe some more in, information about that or maybe doing it in public. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Sharon. All right, not seeing anyone else in the courtroom. We do have one person online. I'm just gonna give the opportunity should she want to speak during public comment. All right, not seeing any hands, I'll go ahead and close public comment. 
moving into the consent agenda. Uh, Madam Chair, I'll, I'll put forward a motion to adopt the consent agenda <laughs> as presented. <clears throat> Thank you. Do I have a second? I will second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. All right, moving into. So now you're going to do presentation. Yep. I'm sorry. Uh, let's do it. Thank you for coming back. Thank <laughs> 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 you for you last month. I'm sorry. No, that's all right. All right. I have a resolution of appreciation for Encompass Community Supports board member Eve Brooks. Whereas Eve Brooks served the citizens of Rappahannock County for five years as a member of the Encompass Community Supports Board, and whereas she sacrificed countless hours as a volunteer for the betterment of Rappahannock County's most vulnerable, vulnerable citizens, and whereas during her tenure on the Encompass Community Supports Board, she guided the body serving as its chair, leading the creation and adoption of a new strategic plan that will direct the services of the organization for the coming year, and whereas her dedicated support was especially felt by the community's older adults and those managing mental health challenges, particularly during the coronavirus pandemic, now therefore be it resolved that the Rappahannock County Board of Supervisors extends its sincerest thanks to Eve Brooks for her generous service on the Encompass Community Supports Board and wishes her all of the best in future endeavors. Be it further resolved that this resolution be spread across the minutes of Rappahannock County Board of Supervisors for all citizens to reflect upon the service and accomplishments of this dedicated public servant adopted this first day of April 60 uh, who could use that service and perhaps even my dream that we could combine the services with uh, uh, for aging in, in one place and have an even more vibrant program so that's my hope for the future I know that uh, of the presence I can look back in some pride to see a very great growing organization that really serves the region so thank you, Janice, for coming. <laughs> so appreciate your time. I promise we're working on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank thank you. You. Congratulations. Thank you.
<laughs> the next is a resolution proclamation for International Dark Sky Week. Becky, you want to come up? This is so much about the park. Yes. Dark sky. Dark sky. So if you don't know, Becky is the chairman of the Rapid County Park Authority. And this proclamation is going to take me a bit, so hopefully I can get through it all. Um, by the Board of Supervisors of Rappahannock County, Virginia, declaring International Dark Sky Week, April uh, 2nd through the 8th, 2024. Whereas the aesthetic beauty and wonder of a natural night sky is a shared heritage of all humankind, and whereas the experience of standing beneath a starry night sky inspires feelings of wonder and awe, and encourages a growing interest in science and nature, especially among young people and out-of-area visitors within Rappahannock County. And whereas light pollution has scientifically established economic and environmental consequences, which result in significant impacts to the ecology and human health of all communities. And whereas 80% of the world's population lives under a dome of light pollution, excessive artificial lighting at night that disrupts natural darkness and may never fully experience the visual wonder or ecological and health benefits of living under a dark sky. And whereas light pollution represents a waste of natural resources amounting to roughly three billion per year of wasted energy in the United States and contributes to diminished energy security. And whereas Rappahannock County, Virginia, is one of the few places on the East Coast where we are still able to enjoy star-filled night skies. And whereas Rappahannock County is home to the Rappahannock County Park, designated by Dark Sky International as a silver tier dark sky park. A silver tier corresponds to nighttime environments that have minor impacts from light pollution and other artificial light disturbance, yet still display good quality night skies and have exemplary nighttime landscapes. And whereas a goal of Rappahannock County's comprehensive plan is to preserve air quality and limit noise and light pollution, and principle three of the plan calls for protection of natural resources, including soil, water, air, view sheds, scenery, night skies, national park access, and fragile ecosystems. And whereas Rappahannock County, a gateway community to Shenandoah National Park, is home to hundreds of nocturnal wildlife species. And these species rely on undisturbed night environments to hunt for food, find mates, and thrive. And whereas Dark Sky International is the globally recognized authority on light pollution and has created International Dark Sky Week to raise awareness of light pollution, and provide free education, resources, and solutions to the public to encourage the protection of and enjoyment of dark skies and responsible outdoor lighting. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed that the Rappahannock County Board of Supervisors declares April 2nd through the 8th, 2024, as International Dark Sky Week in Rappahannock County, Virginia. And we ask each resident to join us, not only in observing and pondering upon this important week, but also in raising awareness and support for protecting our precious dark skies resources. Thank you very much. Thanks, Becky. Appointments. Appointments. Um, can we take a five minute break? Yes. I was just wondering if we could if we could just clarify that it is just legal consultation today during the closed session and there's no anticipation of action. Of course there's never action in closed meeting. Uh, I mean after that though there's not No, an there is not. Mr. Goff and I uh, wanted to inform you the board on a particular matter that we think is best conducted in closed meeting so that you can receive advice of counsel which is necessary to be done in closed meeting. And then uh, whatever action might come out of that will happen in the ensuing months. Right, I just wanted to bring that forward because I do think when things happen in closed session, sometimes there is a concern that there's a kind of gotcha thing 
that will happen after the closed session and there's no intention of any action attached to this closed session today or after this closed session today so i just wanted to bring that forward so um so folks were waiting guess, on something that's not going to happen i guess my only <clears throat> my only concern just for transparency from a transparency in government perspective is um i just want to make sure that that um, the closed session is characterized with a level of specificity that, uh, it, I mean, Ms. Luke made the comment that it basically says to discuss our zoning ordinance. Um, are we... So the law requires us to, to be as specific as reasonably possible, uh, but um, as you might have recalled from your training with um, the FOIA Council, you don't have to... Um, play your hand, so to say, when you're trying to receive legal counsel on a matter that maybe the board doesn't want to do anything about. Okay. Um, and I, I, this is as good a time as any to say that uh, uh, another lawsuit was filed today, and um, I did prepare a second alternate motion if the board wanted to talk about that too, which is actual and litig litigation, which is a separate section. That's up to you which one you decide to pass when you get to that point. Okay. Five minute recess. Yep. Sounds good. Thank you. Sure. Uh, <laughs> recreational facilities authority is to run the park, the county park. The county code requires the board to appoint members via resolution, and you've used a similar format resolution as I've provided uh, attached to the agenda. And these these uh, appointments are generally for four years. However, for somehow, you've managed to get into a cycle where um, five of the um, nine appointees are, will expire at the end of June of 2025, and three will expire at the end of June of 2026. Uh, so it's my recommendation that you take this opportunity to appoint two individuals for terms to expire at the end of 2027 uh, to begin to um, better stagger those terms so you don't have mass turnover at one time. Thanks for doing that uh, kickoff, Gary. And if everyone's wanting to move this forward, I would go ahead and, and make a motion to appoint Laura Skalgi and Michael Shamowitz to um, the RCRFA. With many thanks to Mr. Vincent also for his uh, submission of an application as a part time uh, resident as, as listed on his application. I would think that um, it probably serves the community better to have full time residents serving on the board. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? I would just say I'm always heartened by how many responses we get mm -hmm. with a willingness to serve, um, with no remuneration, and um, a very little thanks often for what you do. So um, thank you very much for your willingness to serve on the park board. I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. All right. Uh, motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Those painless. Thank you. Thank you for Thank stepping you. up, Thank Laura. You You're great. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you very much. It's a great group. Yeah. Uh, next, you have a, a vacancy on your library board uh, due to a resignation. This is for a term that expires December 31, 2027. Uh, you do have, um, you received four applications last December uh, when you, uh, leading up to last December when you made an appointment. Um, that individual had to resign. Uh, I reached out to the three remaining applicants. One withdrew. Uh, one, Ms. Miller, did not respond to me, so I don't know her interest. Uh, but Ms. Cable, who is here, said she would love to be appointed and be the secretary, uh, which I think is... Um, <laughs> she threw all in. <laughs> And the library board would love an, a, a member who also would love to be the secretary. It's a hard bargain. If she's here and she would love to be the secretary and she would be a, love to be a member of the board, I would suggest we, we appoint her post haste. And in, in, that, in that spirit, I would make a motion that we um, I nominate John Cable to serve on the library board uh, for a term to expire on uh, December 31st, 2027. I'll second your motion. And many thanks for your continued interest in that organization. Thanks. And we do really mean it when we say please stay in touch. And when there's another opening, we would love to appoint you in the future. So thank you for, for
for reapplying. Thanks. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 And you opposed. Thank you. 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 Thank County construction and renovation projects. Okay. Um, it, uh, there's a narrative update here. I'll, I'll go ahead and give you a, a quick update. Um, historical building envelope restoration. That project is rolling along. I met with the architect on site. Um, gee, everything just runs together. Maybe last Friday. Definitely <laughs> last Friday. Um, and uh, focusing on in on the jail and the old church. Uh, preceding that, we met at the old church and actually pulled siding off the side of the building to inspect some of the structural framing. So thanks to our maintenance staff for helping with that. Um, so right now, the meeting on Friday was focusing on the porch on the Porter Street side of the jail and then an overall update. Uh, we're, we're trying to do some investigation on that porch. It's really peculiar. It's off-centered. Um, but the oldest photos that I could get from historical society show that it was there um, mm. for uh, before the egress stairway on the uh, right side, if you're out looking from Porter Street, mm. was put in. So we're not really sure. We're, we're continuing to look. Might dig through some board minutes. Um, there's a possible. It is in disrepair, and so there's a, a discussion as to whether to rebuild it to look exactly the same, or possibly reimagine that porch. Uh, to maybe be a little bit smaller. So that's an ongoing effort there. Um, he's also worked a lot on the concepts for pre-qualification and then ultimately bidding these out and getting drawings or with some draft drawings available right now. Courthouse building expansion. Uh, this was mentioned a little bit earlier during your public comment period. Uh, there is a review committee for the RFP. It does include judges, uh, circuit court, um, Juvenile Des Domestic Relations Court, General District Court, all three judges have expressed an interest. Um, <coughs> our first meeting will be this Thursday. Um, and so we'll be coming together reviewing how we each saw the proposals that are available um, and uh, hopefully uh, find some consensus on who we think uh, submitted proposals that best fit our needs so we can shortlist them for presentations with the goal still to provide some recommendations to the board at the May 6th meeting. Excellent. Um, <clears throat> in this context, I wonder if you could, I know that Mr. Stevens and Ms. Waters are now working <coughs> out of the, whatever. We'll 290 say, Gay Street? To, we'll call it, yeah, no longer the county administrator's office. Um, what What is the plan with that building? I mean, it, I know that there have been improvements, some minor improvements made to make it the place that <clears throat> the electrical system in. was replaced so as to remove the risk of catastrophic failure. <laughs> um, and uh, <laughs> Mr. Stevens actually, uh, through his contacts, uh, had a very generous business owner replace the HVAC system at no okay. cost to the county. Um, wow, which That's is amazing. pretty amazing. Yes. Thank you. Um, and I've been generally hesitant to do too much to the building because we don't know the impact of potential courthouse project. And some of the concepts for the courthouse would have that building relocated, and some didn't. And until that pathway really narrows down, I think we just take it step by step with that building. But it's being well used now by our um, full-time R&R coordinator and Stevens as well, who's bouncing all over the place at different hours, doing different shifts and different things, but it's good to have a home base. Is it, is it now, is it workable space now? Mm -hmm. I mean, Absolutely. so you don't, you don't mind spending time there. That's the key. Now that it's not okay. 20 degrees <laughs> inside. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. That's great. Um, my question is Gary, as I recall on that porch addition down at the sheriff's office, um, that's not a, a use of space. It's it's it doesn't serve any kind of so purpose. So there, there's a door into the jail, and I'm sure uh, when the renovations to the jail were completed, whenever it was, I don't know, 50s, 60s, maybe. Um, that was a very important egress route for the people in the institutional use, and so we don't have that institutional use anymore. And so that egress route is not as critical uh, today as it once was. It also 
protrudes off the building quite a bit. Yeah. And um, still trying to nail down the property line there, um, uh, where, where that is, which could play into discussions. Okay. Interesting. Uh, so, uh, I didn't. Uh, there, the memorandum that I sent to the uh, selection committee is attached. If you want to look at it, that expresses uh, uh, expectations for the RFP. Uh, lastly, EMS uh, Sheriff uh, EMS Garage Sheriff Processing Building. This is the essentially three bay garage that is look, would be located down by the tower. Um, I told you last month I thought we'd be going to the ARB in April or in May, in March, it is actually going in April. I did attach a couple things here for you to take a look at. Um, there's a, this is the draft elevations of the building, stick built building, hybrid siding, attempts to fit in with the look of the existing magistrate building, um, which is the EMS building where the <coughs> practitioners are housed. Uh, the door on the right is actually fixed, but put there for, um, for, for look and, and future, uh, because on that side there'd be a storage, a single toilet, and then an area where uh, firefighters can clean their turnout gear from all of our companies. Oh, that's where that's going. Yep. Uh, and then uh, ALS 1400 would be housed here as opposed to under a tent. Mm. Uh, the center bay would be available for flex space and also for the sheriff if she needs to tear down a car or do whatever she needs to do. Um, so. That's that. So Mr. Lassard is working on this with me uh, and the um, site plan, just to give you an idea. Yeah. There you go. So uh, this is the gravel road that goes down and then wraps around behind the, very, the houses. So this is a driveway for some. There's the equipment building for the communications and this is the tower. The new uh, climate response well is back over here, uh, if you're looking at the screen. And so the new building set here, set back. You have a 45 foot setback for the town. Mm -hmm. Where's the road to the well going to go? Uh, the road to the well, um, there will be no road to the well. There will be a, a permanent easement to service the well that will wrap back through this backyard setback. Okay, I see. Okay, got it. Got it. During, the, during installation, <clears throat> there's a temporary easement that basically they're allowed to get all the way through here. The well will be inside the setback line. Access would come through here. Okay. So it's tucked away off over here, which <clears throat> dives down a little bit and presumed to be pretty much out of our way for any future growth that we would want. Okay. So uh, this, my, on my list to do first thing tomorrow is finalize the application for ARB. Uh, so that this would be before the ARB at their April 15th meeting. Uh, and I'm happy to answer any other questions you might have about any of that. Nice to see progress. Yeah, look forward to hearing how it goes. And how about the um, um, the the bunkhouse for ALS 1400? Is that still adequate and configured in a way that's working? So, I mean, I don't want to speak for the practitioners. So long as we have one individual, it's functional. Uh, if you jump to more than one, then you're, we're going to have Okay. I think it particularly you can't have split gender the all kinds of issues okay. uh, but for one it's a lonely existence when you're in there you get TV and chair and a bed right? so I like to think of this peaceful okay <laughs> we, we do sell uh, please come sleep in Rappahannock uh, and get paid maybe take a call hmm. <laughs> and those kids still know me. <laughs> a lot of a lot of people come and spend a lot of money to spend the night in Rappahannock, right? In the bed and a television with a comfortable chair. Is it? Um, yeah. Yeah. That's right. We'll get that fixed real quick. No, is it something that we need to put on our radar though? Of would we? Could you foresee a situation where we need to expand it or? change it in any way now that you've, it's been, you've been operating there for a while? Not that it would dissipate, and certainly nothing that would require change of the footprint. I mean, maybe a reconfiguration if we had to change a staffing model, um, but I don't, see, I don't see any reason to expand the space. I think long term, um, there's a lot to sort out, but we have seven buildings from our volunteer fire company uh, <laughs> partners 
Uh, several of them are envisioning bunk space, have bunk space, and so, you know, they have the space, and so some combined model over time might further leverage their assets. Okay. Yeah, rather than try to build out an eighth place. Uh, right. This is really just the mother of necessity sort of thing. Okay. Uh, and the garage can be repurposed for a non-fire use someday in the future if, if some other model ends up playing out. Okay. Awesome. New commercial activity and related matters. No, I mean, I, <clears throat> no, I mean, <laughs> there, there are a couple things I'm working on with VDOT that, again, goes to the parking situation in town. Um, but they've been awfully busy with tree removal, removal and everything else. So um, I do, I, I do want to emphasize though that um, I, I think you know, someone was talking earlier about how these speed signs really are so far been pretty well received, and I'd like to find a way to add one on um, Warren Avenue because of what will soon come online there with the food pantry and everything else. Yeah, and I, I did not pull data for you this month, and I enjoyed that last month, but I do intend to pull data from the two uh, battery-powered signs, uh, Viewtown Road and then Main Street extended out by Baldwin's uh, to see if that is valuable in conf discussions with VDOT and whether permanent signs would make sense there or be acceptable okay. there. Uh, and then we can strategize on how to how to manage the Warren yeah. Ave one. Yeah, there's just no good place right now. No existing post. So. And definitely not on the historic area no. Mountain uh, that yeah. No. Yeah. No. <laughs> that would be odd. <laughs> General Assembly update. Um, I don't know that you want me to go through all of these, but I did want to, uh, monthly. I've been updating this list for you. Um, new that I just read this morning. Didn't realize on March 26th the governor did sign yeah. uh, HB 74 about the <clears throat> unpaved road, uh, the Loudon bill. Uh, yep. So um, that uh, secondary road funding can be can go to grade our unpaved roads as opposed to hard service them. Uh, the rest are all up in the air and the governor's gonna have to make a decision by the 8th. So we'll see what he does. Very interesting. All right, uh, going into new business secondary six year plan. Uh, board members, you recall every year you go through the same uh, six year secondary plan programming. Um, Historically, at least in my time, uh, we've had a preliminary discussion in April and then a public hearing in May. Uh, so the, the process, as I think most of you are aware, is uh, to allocate funding that is made available to, to Rappahannock County through VDOT, basically fuel taxes and a few other things, to improve gravel roads. There's a much smaller bucket of money that's available to do a a wider range of things, but there's not enough to really do anything. And so historically, it's been combined together to improve gravel roads. Um, the priority list adopted last year, you can see, was Kaiser Run Road, the second section. Uh, uh, first section is complete. The second <coughs> section is under design, will be constructed the end of uh, this summer. Uh, Horton Hollow Road, an extension uh, from the, let's say, the far end uh, towards the narrow section is all that VDOT thought could be done. Uh, that's next up on the list, Poland's Bluff, which connects Kaiser Run and Gid Brown. And then added last year was Sycamore Ridge Road. Uh, so those are on your list now. Because this plan continues to advance one year, uh, last year's year five, or year six is this year's year five. And so there's now some capacity at the end of the plan for you to consider um, identifying another road. Um, that identification includes public hearing process. And so the important thing to happen now is to identify which roads do you want to put out to the public to consider to add to the plan. And um, over the last several years, we've been putting up some step-in signs to make sure the citizens understood what was happening so they could express their support or, um, or non-support for a, a road surfacing project. Two roads have come to the attention of uh, local VDOT and myself as being likely additions, potential additions. The second section of Turkey Ridge Road, which would take improvements from O'Bannon's Mill. The first project runs at 0.8 miles. The second project would run another 0.8 miles 
to the narrow bridge, and that's as far as you can go uh, beyond that. The road geometry doesn't support it. The second section would be there's a, a middle section of Castleton View Road uh, that is, there's gravel, there's some maintenance paving, and then some more gravel before you have hard surface on either end. This would carry through the entire section of gravel and the maintenance paving on a slope to improve that entire section. Both of those costs in the 600 or so plus thousand dollar range estimated right now, they could both be added to that year six and be partially funded and hang off the plan. Uh, and then it would just burden next year when we go through it. We, you're allowed to have a project that doesn't fit on the plan, it hangs off the end of the plan for a funding need. Uh, if there are other roads the board would want to consider, uh, we can add those as well. There's a tracking table that we have been using to identify what roads have we talked about in the past? Um, and, and where, where have we gone with those? Uh, there are several, for example, Grimsley and North Post, the citizens have been absolutely not, don't touch our road. Uh, and then here in the last few years, we've talked about a few roads. People have expressed an interest maybe to do a road like Mill Hill Road, but then they find out what that means and then that the character change might be just a bridge too far. Uh, so roads also should have 50 vehicles per day VDOT has allowed us to look back a couple years to get that. Um, but uh, so Gid Brown Hollow uh, maybe doesn't meet that standard. Uh, Swindler Hollow um, did a few years ago, but doesn't in the most recent counts. Um, and then, of course, Castleton View and Turkey Ridge. So uh, what I'm asking for now is your, your direction on what to advertise for a public hearing and where to place the signs so then in May, uh, all those people can come tell you where they want you to hard surface. Well, I can uh, inform the rest of the board that Company 5 uh, has reached out to me many times specifically about Castleton View Road and the condition that it gets in uh, rattles their vehicles. I mean, they, they, they truly say when they're driving, amb when ambulances go down there, I mean, this is, it stuff's flying off shelves and it's just they have been really requesting that that road get paid attention to um i know that um i made a real deep plea for turkey ridge road for both of them and i know the constituents on there would love it but i, I hear what company five is saying and, and i agree with them that the direction that they're going from when they leave to respond they hit gravel roads and uh, so I just wanted to let you guys know that that's what I'm hearing from them and they would love to have that road paid attention to. So you're suggesting moving it up? Well, it's I mean, not on the list today. Uh, right. Castleton View Road, if, uh, that would be, I, I would love to have Priority. both of them on Turkey Ridge to get that fixed, but Castleton View <coughs> has a, an immediate need for the first responders back there that do you want to advertise both of them or just the one? Well, I don't know. I mean, what do you think is the best way to do? Yeah, advertise. Let's see if we could just do both and just see what people turn up. Yep. Yeah, let's do it. I mean, I agree about Castleton View. You're a little more pragmatic. I was thinking of all the people going back there for breakfast now. Most <laughs> months you might want it paved. But the, but the response well, time is definitely, yeah, definitely yeah, yeah. more serious and pressing need and, um, yeah. and uh, along the same lines. Yeah. Yeah. If, that if it, the, it is important to get that route to the fire station yeah. right. Yeah. If, if the volunteer fire department is going to get to 522, yeah. it's a long way around if they try to avoid that section of road. It yeah. sure and is. It's rough. Yes. And you know. <laughs> and where are we on, uh, where did we end up on, um, <clears throat> hopefully you can remind me on the Long Mountain Road question from Rock Mills up to Grandview? So um, VDOT said that it didn't meet the geometry requirements. Because we did. And there was a discussion, can you do more maintenance? Now, the new bill, uh, as we go forward, mm. um, it's I'm not sure how that's going to play out. Will it still need to meet the geometry requirements, just not end up with a hard surface? and stale stay gravel, would it allow roads to be narrower but improved? I don't know. Um, where you can invest some of these dollars to improve a gravel road and have it end up being gravel. And is there, by now I suppose I should know this, but is there some sort of 
compromise in between um, surfacing treatment that could be placed on that? Like, um, what, what do you Probably what would happen is be improved geometry, improved roadside ditching, better crowning so that it can stand up better to the environment without a hard surface. Okay. I'm guessing, but the, the, those guidelines, which I assume will come, have not been developed yet. Something to keep. And it's not effective until July one. But right. yeah, it's just it's just an ongoing battle. Um, that whole road actually all the way down to to Battle Run. Yeah, that will run. And I think there'll probably be mixed yeah, mixed support for keeping it quaint. Well, uh, it's just, yeah, I mean, there's nothing quaint about, um, for anyone. Well, there was <laughs> about, a... About, you know, washboard and pothole. There was a project considered last year or the year before to extend the paved surface of, um, to the corner uh, coming from the other side. Uh, so 211, I guess, what is that, Long Mountain Road? Mm -hmm. And it goes down, and then it hangs a sharp right where Battle Run Road goes left. Correct. And there was a, a project to potentially ex extend the hard surface from where it ends now to that corner. Yeah, that, and the neighbor said no. Yeah, I recall. Yeah. And that's the easiest part to do. Okay. Okay. So... Um, I'll make a motion to authorize county administration to advertise the annual veto secondary six-year plan for public hearing to be held at May 6th, 2024, regular board meeting. Uh, whoops. Uh, you can just add a road list of names. And then, uh, well, I just lost my point. Uh, to add uh, Turkey Ridge Road, Castleton View Road, you want them SR615 and SR616. Okay. As listed in the agenda. As listed in the agenda. Okay. I'll second that motion. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Declaration of local state of emergency. Okay. Uh, two things to do here. Uh, one, hello, uh, Mr. Stevens, to give you a quick update. Um, but the other, uh, whenever the director of emergency management, who you appointed me to, to that role, uh, deems it necessary to declare a local state of emergency, the Board of Supervisors must ratify that within 45 days at your next meeting. Uh, this is the next meeting. So I have attached uh, a resolution to that end to allow you to do that. And I did receive some questions about, well, what, what does a declaration mean? And um, I pulled out of the Code of Virginia section 44-14621, the main <coughs> section that speaks to that and broke it down into bullets to make it a little bit more digestible. So the, um, the director can control, restrict, allocate, regulate the use of sale, production, and distribution of food, fuel, clothing, and other commodities, materials, goods, services, resource systems, which fall only within the boundaries of that jurisdiction and which do not impact systems affecting adjoining and other political subdivisions. Enter into contracts and incur obligations necessary to combat such threatened or actual disaster protect the health, safety, and persons and property and provide emergency assistance to the victims of such disaster, proceed with that regard to time-consuming procedures and formalities prescribed by law, except as mandatory by the Constitution, pertaining to the performance of public work, entering into contracts, occurring obligations, employment of temporary workers, dot, dot, dot. So that is really the main one that would come to bear potentially. And so um, your purchasing thresholds and things like that could be set aside if if something was critically sensitive, uh, time sensitive, and needed to be done right away, we wouldn't have to say, well, hold on, I'm going to put this in the newspaper and wait for three high bids. We can just get it taken care of. Um, very rare in this area that that would come to bear. Um, what it also does is allows us to work with the state to request statewide mutual aid, which in this case we did, uh, ultimately did not need. Um, but it's nice to be able to do that and then pay for those resources um, expenses if they were provided and uh, be happy to go into that in more depth at some point in time uh, I'm fortunate that we're in a community that we don't need to do this very often well, I just want to say that um, it, we that was a uh, frightening day and I just want to thank all the first responders out there who did an incredible job uh, across the region and 
especially here at home, uh, keeping everybody safe. It was, it was, I, I just, I was sitting at home and I could just hear first responders just flying down 522 every direction for a long time. So um, I'll make a motion to adopt the resolution then, uh, confirming the declaration of a local state of emergency. I'll second that. We have a motion and a second discussion. Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 And then uh, Darren can give you a, a quick uh, briefing, and then uh, as he'll tell you where uh, he is working on an after action report that will take some time. Hey, Madam Chair, uh, members of the board, thank you. A lot of today we spoke about housing in the county, and I appreciate being given a few minutes to talk about the extraordinary efforts by our volunteers in the system to ensure that we don't lose any more housing. Um, if you read the reports and you see what's going on in some of our neighboring jurisdictions, several, several counties weren't as fortunate as we. Um, March 20th, uh, just, before, just before 1 p.m., our 9-11 center got their first 911 call, and it was for a fire next to the Q stop, or I'm sorry, the Quick Mart on Route 211. Um, and that was the beginning of a 12-hour period that probably tested the mettle of our, our, our systems volunteers, as well as all the systems around us. During the next 12 hours, we responded to 12 separate fires within our county, with over 67 volunteers giving nearly 800 man hours of work and effort that day. Three fires proved, <clears throat> excuse me, three fires proved to be significant, each taking dozens of responders, several hours to bring them under control. Several local citizens and businesses contributed both time and resources and heavy equipment to, um, to help with our, our response that day. One of the most significant was um, our local co-op brought shovel water trucks out and helped shuttle water to some of the more remote areas on that day. Um, they all played a significant role in, in our success. Uh, one of the challenges we learned early on was all of our regional partners that we rely on for day-to-day -day responses were all in the same boat as, as us. Um, so, well, we had some we had some relief and some assistance from them early on in the day. By four o'clock, most of them had been recalled back to their county and were no longer available. Um, at that point, we made a request to the statewide mutual aid for additional brush units and additional tankers. We did within the hour. We had three brush units coming: one from Gloucester, one from Abingdon, and one from Virginia Beach. Um, Fortunately, about 8.30, we, we got our large fire down in um, off Battle Mountain under control. And then I had a conversation with uh, Chief Burke, our incident commander on the, um, Red Oaks. Excuse me, the Red Oak fire. And he said that they thought they could handle without, they were, without additional resources. We were able to return them back to the hopper. And as I understand it, VDEM repurposed or reassigned uh, them, and they served in both Page in Shenandoah County wow. for the next few days. Wow. Uh, well, we had over 180 acres of, of food, of wildland lost. Uh, we didn't displace any residents or we lost no structures or buildings. Uh, despite the extremely tough terrain, the smoky conditions and the uh, incredibly long work hours, we had no injuries to report throughout the day, which I, again is wow. remarkable. Um, I'm collecting information as, as we speak from all of our chiefs and other stakeholders from that day to do a SWOT analysis and pr perform a good um, or a better after action report. And I look forward to sharing that with this board. Um, just tell you that the re that process is ongoing. <clears throat> the next day, um, Thursday after the fire, Mr. Curry and myself did a, a windshield tour of, of a lot of these places. I spent this day in our dispatch center with four absolutely remarkable ladies that um, contributed a great deal to the calmness of that day. The, the, the number of calls that came into the dispatch center were overwhelming, both on the 911 call and the, and the, general, um, the general lines. We were able to start pushing some social media posts out. I appreciate those of you that shared them. It helped calm a lot of those um, just questions that were coming in, um, and it built our social media presence by quite a bit. Um, over the last two weeks, we've actually had four requests from people that are interested in volunteering with our local firehouses. So we were able to divert those to, um, to companies where they live. And we've had several people that are interested in what they can do if something like we're faced with something like this in the future. Um, some types of grassroots organization come out and be ready to support first responders to help us meet these, um, meet these demands. So it was, um, 
as, as Mr. Curry said in the paper, it was a really proud day to be part of this organization and, and see the response that was mounted. One of the challenges that faces our fire and rescue system, um, we, you know, we've talked about an aging population here. Well, that was what championed our system that day because our aging population was available and ready to respond. Mm. Um, so now I, I couldn't have been prouder of what we did that day and what we accomplished. We were one of the few counties that went to bed that night, just before midnight, I might add, that all of our fires had been put out. Thank you. Is there any more Incredible. questions? Thank you. I went, up, uh, I went up on Red Oak afterwards, and I heard Ray tell me they, that they got it under control around 11. I drove up on Sunday, and there's still snag smoking. So. Yeah. But, I mean, it got, it went around that excavator, and it yeah. got so close to those the, the the two buildings up yeah. there, the barn and the house. And there's some happened. incredible, there's some good lessons learned, um, you know, fire-wise, um, landscaping. You know, those yards were clear debris. They, they, they were well maintained and well kept, so there weren't, there weren't dead leaves on it for it to float to go across. Mm. Going to some of the other areas in the county where you could see it just blew across the open fields because of just a small amount of dead debris or, um, I guess, available fuels were on the surface to wow. burn. So, no, it was, it was fortunate, but there, I guess, the lesson is that they, did take, they were well manicured and well taken care of and prepared for such an event. Thank you. Yes, thank Public you. Public Safety Committee will talk about this you know, probably not a lot more detail tomorrow, uh, and then you know have discussions at a later date when the report is. Designed. Thank you, Oz. Yeah, kudos to this. One. I did. I did have a question about: Was there a tie-in with the event to the rave system at all, or is that does that not tie in when there's fires locally? Because it seems like fires are uh, when there are the the brush fires, the wildfires. That is one of the most dangerous events that we experience in the county. So for and is there an opportunity to get word out that way? Because I had I had people asking me if there um, if there was a need for evacuation that would have been used. And the concern when you get into a um, when it, when an event is threatening, it's a good tool. When an event is happening, I think we need to very carefully avoid. Um, the possibility of scaring people, not knowing what the call is for, missing it, and thinking they're in the way, real harm's way, as opposed to needing to be evacuated. And so it's a, it's a scalpel use when, when it's really um, in your face. Okay. Um, but yes, that tool's available, was available, and fortunately, we never got to a point where evacuations were required. Culpepper did, on their abandoned mill fire, have uh, as I understand it, some evacuations. Oh, I saw those yeah. vehicles responding. It was very impressive. Yeah, we were we were extremely blessed compared to a lot of our neighbors. Mm -hmm. I drove to um, Charlestown uh, and um, or drove to the other side of 81 and just seeing the seeing the side of the mountain, the other side of the mountain. It was yeah. remarkable. Yeah, thank you for all you did. And to all of our volunteer first responders, and it sure is a testament to the folks that either choose to age in place in the county or retire in Rappahannock County and get involved uh, with our emergency responders. Oh, they definitely our volunteers shine brightly. As a way to, as a way to uh, stay connected to the community. The number of people that just stopped to ask if they could help in any way, bring food, bring water, the water truck, the huge water truck, pool truck, I guess it was, mm -hmm. that was on Battle Mountain. Um, Luckily, the deputy gave him directions on how to get on to 729 to get to wherever they needed him the most, but it wasn't at Battle Mountain. Um, and then the gentleman that had the loader, I wish I'd have gotten his contact information, but I do know that he said he lived near Amosville um, Fire Department, so if that helps in any way. He went home, got the loader, came back, sat and waited until they decided where they really needed him, and he was just fine trying to help. I have a working list of, of people that were able to record and that had contributed. Um, it's still growing. Going through the incident reports, I'll, you know, pretty much in a lot of detail these last few days, um, the, the communications officer did a really good job of adding that type of information in. So I think we were able to, in the future, possibly get a list together so we could recognize not only the, the impact our responders made, but um, possibly all, all the citizens and businesses that stepped up to help. That's great. While Jeff's in the room, Rappahannock Electric was literally on Battle Mountain Road with the burnt woods to the left, 
getting the electric back up for the family that was on the right side of the road and a mom that was ex her daughter was expecting a baby any time so she was like freaking out because she didn't have the power and you guys came out and in the middle of this and took care of things i was so impressed thank you all. Thanks, i would say i i would echo everything that everyone just said but i'll also um thank mr curry for acting so quickly um i know in some neighboring counties the action maybe was not as quick so i just I'm As we're the lead. thinking everyone else, yeah. I'd like to also I follow the lead you. of the practitioners and you know when when there are resources that we need that we don't have, that's when we really need to think about declaring so we can reach beyond our normal reach. That's not redundant enough for you. You can try <laughs> to make it more redundant. Thank you, Karen. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Discussion yeah, regarding <laughs> outside legal counsel for land use. Uh, this is a topic that was brought up last month, uh, and uh, was, there was a discussion, I think, maybe in matters presented by the board or something, uh, that it should be carried forward to the next meeting as an agenda item, and here it is. I'm not sure. Uh, you and Art said you were going to talk about it. We, uh, and then present us with some options. Oh, oh, well, so, but right. there was an informal discussion at the last meeting, so oh, okay. and nobody was tasked with doing anything. Oh, I thought that was um, okay. So I think we talked offline about it some, but uh, oh, that's what we left in the meeting. Okay, well, so then, um, apropos of our discussion last time, um, it was mainly just about big picture stuff that we can task when we need it, a uh, specialized zoning attorney if we need it, uh, to do some work for it. Yeah, and I think you know. Art and I haven't talked about it too much, and I think some of you might have talked to Art a little bit about it, and um, we can certainly look at different ways to do it. My hesitancy last time was that I didn't want to leave the meeting and take some action that was questionable whether the board asked me to do it or not, and you couldn't really ask me to do anything because it wasn't a, an agenda item last time. So I'm comfortable with us just strategizing on ways to expand capacity yeah. uh, and, in a way that can flex in and out and then bring back suggestions. Could we tie that into the next agenda item? I'd be really curious to see how other um, counties are handling their legal needs. I tried to do some uh, review of budgets from uh, other neighboring small localities, and it may looks like they may be just um, kind of hiring on help as they need on an as needed basis. Um, and certainly different attorneys have different specialties, but I, I do think this is one occasion where we would really benefit from more information about what other small localities are doing um, to navigate this increasingly complex world. I think it's rare for a Commonwealth attorney in these days to be a county attorney. Um, I think it might have been the rule at one point in time, and we're very unique being our size. Uh, and it, it's worked here. Um, many other localities fully contract for county attorney services, and then others, when they're a little bit larger, um, just have full-time county attorneys. And I don't think we have the need for a full-time county attorney. Um, and so having the model we have has worked, you could <coughs> potentially contract. And if you did that, you would be looking for a firm that had the various areas that you, if you wanted to flex, you would want to flex within that firm, not bring some other firm in. Correct. Um, and then having county attorney on staff as a common attorney, then if you need to flex, then it would just be for that atypical uh, workload that comes along. So do you need direction or action? I don't think I need action. I just want to, you know, I want to know. We want to, I want to know, because clearly it wasn't, it wasn't clear last time that I was. Okay, got it. Okay was charged to do something so i just want to make sure i know what i'm um, committing to do and if it's art and i to evaluate ways that we can expand capacity on a time-to-time -time basis as yes. needed then we can do that. options absolutely okay. was your zoning specific though that's i don't want to get yeah, to this is what the stuff we're doing with the berkeley group I mean, we got we got a lot yep and so well. you know just as we move forward in the next you know, just to have an idea of if we want to get something done and we say, hey, you know, Mr. Goff, can you get this done in the next month? And you're like, oh, man, I don't know. 
there's going to be a list of things that we would be, be benefited from just to know what's out there. And like Ms. Smith is saying, there, there are other ways of doing this. So um, just to look into it and see uh, what our options are is probably beneficial. Well, when, when we uh, went to using the Berkeley group, um, the position of our staff was that they could support the Berkeley group work. So I, I have to say I don't, I don't really support bringing on legal counsel other than maybe as a final review of the Berkeley group work. I don't want them just dabbling. I don't want to pay for dabbling. I don't want to pay for what our staff should be doing. Um, I 100% agree with you. I do not want to pay for, for dabbling. So I, I think if we're going to no do dabbling. this, we need to do it in a very targeted way. And um, I mean, you can, you can smile when you say that, but we were assured when we took on the Berkeley group work by the county attorney, the county administrator, and the zoning administrator that they would support the work and see it through. And so there, if there is a change now and the staff is no longer able to accommodate that, then this is a big decision and a big change. And it, uh, what's our budget for this? How are we gonna pay for this? This, is, this initiative or request doesn't come from staff. So this is something that came up at the board, by well, the board. So. I'm, just say, I'm just saying it is a departure from the way we have conducted this business to date, and I have serious concerns about bringing in outside people to do Rappahannock County work. It's sort of contrary to the way we've always done things. We've always been building ourselves up by our bootstraps, and um, and I, I, I frankly, I, I don't think we should throw money at all of our problems. Sometimes we just have to solve them. Well, I'm not suggesting we do that. I'm suggesting that the plan that was set forth, which was get the Berkeley group, and uh, we have a county attorney. Occasionally, it might be beneficial to get help. However, in order to do that, we just have to have some information about what that would even look like. So that's what I feel like we're discussing right now. Not budgets, not just preliminary, hey, what does this look like? And I actually think it's a good idea with what you were suggesting, which is that, um, you know, final review or, I mean, yeah, we can throw a lot of money in a lot of different places, and so we have to be careful, I agree. Um, I just think it's due diligence to kind of just get to this point and say, oh, you know, hey, why don't we just look at this? We're not committing to anything. All right, uh, request from county attorney. We have. There was no motion, so I, okay. I think I understand what we want done. Just options, yeah. Um, uh, I don't need to speak for the county attorney who's <coughs> here. Um, in 2017, um, the board constituted that time uh, by resolution, which is attached, um, uh, uh, contracted, for lack of a better word. Uh, with him to be the county attorney for uh, $45,000 subject to these six uh, paragraphs. Uh, this entire resolution is silent on whether that $45,000 value would ever change uh, as um, salaries are prone to change for other county employees uh, by COLA or whatever this board might do. Uh, the county attorney has asked for the board's consideration to uh, modify that resolution by identifying that that $45,000 should change consistent with cost of living, uh, if any, and the same increases that um, are approved by the board, if any, in the same manner as awarded to other Rappahannock County employees generally. And that wording is essentially parallels the wording in my employment contract. Well, then I will move to adopt the provided resolution as presented. I'll second the motion. We have a motion and a second discussion. All right, hearing none, it's roll call vote. Yes, please. Um, Ms. Comer? Aye. Ms. Smith? Aye. Mr. Whitson? Aye. Mr. Carney? Aye. And I also. Thank you. Thank you. Board 
committee reports, ban recreational facilities. Fodderstack is doing uh, the, the numbers for the Fodderstack are looking good. We've got a lot of people signing up. Um, so that's coming up on, uh, oh man, April, April 20th. 20th. April 20th. April 20th. April 20th. April 20th. It should be good. Um, I know we're going to have wonderful weather yes. and lots of people, and it's going to be amazing. Um, so, yeah, look forward to that. Excellent. Uh, public safety is meeting tomorrow. Is there a reason why there's no public comment on the public safety agenda? I don't know what we've I mean, I went I don't back know if there ever has been. I don't know. Has there been? Yeah, I went back actually. I, I reviewed it because I, I was going to suggest to somebody that they stop uh, by there tomorrow night. They have had something on their mind, and I suggested the place to talk about it was the Public Safety Committee. And so I looked to see what was on the agenda and noticed that there was no public comment. Um, and then I went back and looked. I recall there was public comment in the past, so I pulled up the agendas from 2019, and there's public comment on those agendas. So I don't know if when there was a change in leadership, maybe they just fell yeah. off yeah. the agenda. General, generally, it's a pretty easygoing group, and people from the gallery talk, and the people on the body talk, and it's just yeah. A big, but happy but if people don't see that there's a public comment yeah. period available, they may not be inclined to show up and well, comment. We, we can add it tomorrow, and then just. I don't disagree and just have it as part of the agenda going forward. That would be great. Yeah. Thank you very much. <coughs> planning commission update. Um, we had a very lively planning commission meeting, the last planning commission. Um, I think we had every resident of a certain road up in Chester Gap show up to the planning commission meeting, which I don't think has ever happened before. Um, but it went really well and we had a, a good update on the ordinance which we will review this evening as well. Excellent. Uh, Fire Levy Board, did it meet? Um, no. Not since your last meeting. No. Okay. All right. Uh, treasurer's reports. Information's available. Uh, nothing looks out of ordinary. Looks great. want to pull up anything or are we good moving forward? <laughs> the only thing I noticed on the um, year-to-date expenses were at about 64% um, dollars used out of the budget. Is that about right for now? Yeah. Okay. thought we'd be closer to 75 or so, but there's a benefits are generally about 75 dollars depending on the demand and the economy of other payments that can affect that overall um usage a lot of things are on a quarterly basis yep. so we'll, yeah. you'll get a big tranche coming up yeah when i went through the reports i made sure to look at all the salary and benefits since that's where a lot of our expense is right and those were generally in line with where i would have expected it to be great all right uh Review of legal matters. Um, let's see for the two I underlined a little section for the Williams case. I don't know if it's been filed or not, but Mr. <coughs> Connick informed the legal counsel for the county that he intended to file a motion seeking an expedited hearing before the Court of Appeals. Uh, to my knowledge, the Court of Appeals is not scheduled, scheduled a hearing at this point. <coughs> Um, he claimed that was needed because of actions of Flint Hill Fire re uh, relative to um, uh, members there who um, he made a connection with the fires and that those individuals would have been able to respond to those fires. Um, but those individuals haven't responded much to other calls, so maybe they would respond to that day. I don't know. Uh, so I don't know if that's been filed or not. But it was a threatened draft. It was a, it was a draft. Not sure it's been filed. Uh, did we? Uh, well, it was Cliff Robinson and I got on a uh, conference call with Mr. Caps, and he's he planned he had planned to respond to it if it were in fact filed in the court of appeals. It's not being filed here. In the expedited a request for an expedited hearing with the allegation that the court of appeals had already scheduled a an oral argument on the 25th of June. But no one on our side has been informed of that. So I don't know where that came from. 
was this a <clears throat> was this draft the one dated uh, the 28th of March? I believe so. Okay, and it was the one in which appended to the filing was was the emergency declaration that we just approved. It, that's correct. Okay, so that so what we saw was not an actual filing. It was simply a draft it of what he might file. A draft of the documents he requested under FOIA from Mr. Kirby. Okay. Um, so, uh, Mr. Katz didn't think, seem to think that it was something <coughs> that we needed to worry about uh, and that he would respond if it were in fact actually filed. And it was uh, plaintiff's counsel described it as a courtesy copy. He did not copy me. He only sent it to Mr. Robinson and then Mr. Robinson contacted me about it. That's when we got it. Did he serve it on? It was a surprise to me and to to uh, Whit that there was this 25th of June date out there for oral argument. We'd never heard that. Before. Was it served on Mr. Capps? Well, it's not been no. served. It's not been filed, so nothing's been served. Okay, but it, was a, a a courtesy copy given to Mr. Capps? No. We forwarded it to him. And then, of course, the problem was that what the reason why Mr. Robinson was very concerned was he wasn't sure if he was actually still counsel for the defendant officers. Uh, they had indicated that they were going to hire Mr. Ashwell's firm. So uh, that's still all up in the air as well, whether or not Mr. Ashwell's firm has officially made an appearance in the Court of Appeals case that's before the Court of Appeals. So that's that case. Um, at, on the Court of Appeals website, they do have items docketed through the beginning of May. This case does not show up on anything that, on that website. Um, then for the Caparuccio case, um, uh, we've discussed before, this is an issue between siblings and who controls a piece of property. The sister has received court authority to control the property. Uh, the brother still lives on the property. Uh, we're just trying to get him to straighten it out. We were contacted by a large contractor who is to be hired by the sister to restore the property. Um, so hopefully it's going to work out. Yeah. And then uh, today I received notice that Mr. Connick filed a lawsuit um, regarding the recent change to the tourist home uh, special regulations, 176066K. Um, um, basically saying that you can't do what you did, uh, which, of course, is a delayed enactment to July, so you haven't really done anything or disadvantaged anybody at this point. Uh, so, um, as I noted earlier, if you want to talk with your counsel about that actual litigation during closed meeting, you could, and I've prepared a motion to allow you to do that. Otherwise, I'll be forwarding it to the insurance company, and they'll assign it to somebody, uh, possibly Mr. Capps, possibly somebody else. <coughs> So the clock is not ticking. The clock's not ticking. Uh, but it is filed. Do we track our insurance dollars and how much of it's being used for? Not actively. Um, we're not in that loop. The attorneys do not bill the county, and then the county seek funding from the insurance company. The attorneys work for the insurance company and bill them directly. Uh, so we, we don't. Uh, so there's $100,000 for land use. Um, and then there's the, the other hundred thousand for non uh, what's it called non monetary, non -monetary damages claims yeah. such as for your claims injunctions and damages all that but we can check in with the insurance company from time to time and it's based on plan year do our premiums um, <coughs> our do our premiums hinge to um, <coughs> how how actively we're relying on our litigation insurance I assume to some extent that they're experience based but um, the recent insurance um, we had an increase in workers comp because of the the experience modification factor went from super low to just under one but I don't think the professional liability changed all that much we haven't got the renewal rates yet we'll find out 
Well, I think it's very interesting that every single one of these lawsuits up here, including this new one, involve one in particular human being that lives in this county. And I would like to know, uh, over the past 10 years, how many lawsuits Mr. Connick has been involved with with the county. That's what I want to know. Do you want me to name them for you? <laughs> I would, I would love a list, because that's where all of our money is going. Yeah. A lot of attention, and um, so since we've revised our insurance policy for the non-monetary charges, there haven't been many financial obligations of the county, but it does take a lot of time and effort, particularly if they make it through to discovery, um, and usually before that through freedom of information. And there are other ways to solve disputes. There are amicable ways to solve disputes. There are also ways to solve disputes where you pursue legal means, but you also work with other people to get things done. I suppose ultimately it's uh, dependent on uh, whether it's outcome driven or not. Or ego driven. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm going to move on to building permits, zoning administrator, or anything in there. Emergency services we heard. I don't think there's anything um, major in any of these other reports. Okay. All right. Moving into matters presented by the board. Ms. Comer? I have nothing today. Ms. Smith? Um, I don't know if the citizen that I, I had recommended the Public Safety Committee to or not will, will be able to attend the meeting tomorrow night or not. But um, what I had spoken uh, to them about or what they had spoken to me about was the um, truck situation on the bridge near the rescue squad um, in Sperryville. And Mr. Curry's been very helpful in kind of trying to <coughs> not those problems um, and see what may be causing them. And it seems like there's disparate causes, but mostly nothing that the county can really affect. It's uh, the trucking company gave bad direction or... I ran into a roadblock with that because that trucking company just went through bankruptcy and it's like, I don't even know who holds... Well, they won't be sending any more trucks. Well, I don't know. I mean, maybe. it's a Chapter 11 thing, so then their assets are restructured. I mean, I couldn't find the people to talk to. So I, I do just want to say I recognize, especially for the people that live in that immediate proximity, that that is a real concern. And um, it also is a concern in, in terms of um, emergency response to the west end of Sperryville. Um, so didn't, I just wanted to mention that. Didn't VDOT, or specifically didn't Mr. Nesbitt at one point talk about a, a reconfiguration of that intersection? That, that came up in the guise of the um, <coughs> PA GAP um, program, yeah. looking at multimodal, and that that bridge doesn't have a sidewalk. And so in the future, a sidewalk could be built on a separate bridge like is done over a, on the other side of town, or if and when that bridge is replaced and the center pier is removed, which would help with flooding and different things, it could be built wider and, oh, by the way, if you're going to replace the bridge, maybe you straighten up the intersection at the same time. And the oh, that's sorry. way in the future if and when that bridge is deemed needed to be replaced. And, I mean, at the end of the day, VDOT owns the bridge. Yeah. And so uh, whatever happens with the bridge will be a VDOT determination with a certain amount of input from us. But one thing someone did recommend to me, um, which I thought might be helpful, is um, is instead of having just kind of that um, <coughs> aluminum or whatever it is, guardrail that buckles whenever it's hit. And the, I think two times ago when it was hit, it was hit in the middle of the night and they didn't even know what hit it. It was just banged up. So, But if you were to replace that with a concrete embankment, like the one uh, on the corner there at the Estes house, that might be more of a deterrent. Yeah, I, for, I would for highly doubt there. that would happen. Um, it's there to decelerate a vehicle that has gone terribly in the wrong direction coming down 211. Yeah. Um, and if you had a concrete barrier, the VDOT wouldn't consider it safe. Whereas in the middle of town, people aren't supposed to be going too fast. Supposed to be going too fast. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Gary. Except when they're racing the sign. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, Mr. Whitson. Nope. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I do have one thing I wanted to ask about, which was um, 
that presentation that we got about, uh, I don't know if it's enhancing, but the memorial up at Thornton River Orchard, is there any updates on that? Remember when he came and gave us a presentation? Uh, there's an interest to put some display panels. Yes. Um, and I think there was a grass outreach to the grassroots group to figure out what they might want to do. And I think that grassroots is pretty loose. So okay. it hasn't really and figured then, it out. And I think yet. someone had a, a death in the family, if I remember correctly. And so things were kind of, and I honestly, I haven't engaged since I heard that, but I, I will circle back and see where things are. Yeah. So the, the, the ground lease would need to be fixed a little bit, and I, the, the grant tour would probably allow it. Um, and then someone would have to decide how many signs, what do you want them to say, and who's going to pay for it. That's mm -hmm. the easy part. Um, but getting everybody together to figure that out. I thought, I thought it was a really good, great idea, so yeah. I yeah. Yeah, didn't know where it was. Okay. Thanks. That's it. Um, just wanted to let everybody know the Fauquier Free Clinic uh, just celebrated on March 22nd, 30 years of helping a lot of people in multiple counties. Um, I don't, they doubled their dental chairs, I think, last year. It's just amazing. If you haven't been into the free clinic, I would really recommend going and seeing what all was offered. They are still interested in having a site out here like they used to years ago, um, which hopefully one day a week or something may happen. Um, food pantry had the topping off. That was pretty interesting to see what they're doing. It's going to be so light and um, much nicer for the volunteers and the citizens that use the service. Uh, and being right next to Rapid Home and social services, everything in that one area is really um, coming together well. And then the other thing I had was, can we get RSW to start cleaning up some roadsides before VDOT starts mowing? Um, it's, we just have to ask. They're going to, we've asked them to look at Potterstack. Yeah, the sheriff brought up, brought up the fodder stack at our regional Five, jail meeting. 522 from Massey's Corner to Chester Gap. It's just looking awful. Um, I, speaking of trash, I, if you don't mind, Go for it. I, I, a citizen picked, <laughs> a citizen got ahead of me and picked up on Harris Hollow Road, which I've adopted for, I know, uh, for the last 15 years. Um, I typically try to do it once a quarter, but they got out there before Easter. So if anyone, if anyone wants to take credit for that, I want to thank them because they did a great job and it was in really bad shape. Mm -hmm. It was astounding. And the office has signage now. For yeah, we have signage and grabbers and vests and bags. You want to sign them up? Just stop by our place. We'll give you all the tools you need to pick up trash. Oh, wow. I, didn't I always that. need bags, so now I know where to go. And so we have we receive funds from the state for litter prevention, and it's for purchase from them. Yeah. So you give Bonnie a yeah. count of how many bags she filled, and then we put it in our report. Oh. that's great. All right, that's all I had closed meeting uh, so I don't know what the pleasure of the body is relative to I'd like to talk about both of those I'd like to talk about both also okay <clears throat> thank you everyone thanks a lot thanks guys you don't have to leave yet you want to read be this clear. Um, real quick before we get into closed session All right, down at, um, <clears throat> at Amosville, at the uh, intersection of Weaver Road and, and 211 yeah. on Holly Springs Road, we continue to have accidents there. They've done a lot of work there. They put a turning lane in that helped, and but they continue to come out into the road and have accidents. So we, I would like to have VDOT back there to reassess that again and see what can be done. I know something can be done. They're in the process of looking at all of the intersection of secondaries tying into primaries. Okay. Yeah, all right. like rumble strokes. Or... All right, then the second one is there's been several accidents on Route 211 on the right-hand side of the westbound lane past Williams intersection. There, and there has been one fatality, but there continues, and there have been several people that's run over in that same spot. Luckily, we didn't have fatality. There's no reason they can't put up some guardrail there. So I'm requesting that they look at that and put up some guardrail. And then the, the next question is, 
Woodward Road. We've, had, we've heard several complaints about the safety issues on Woodward Road. And I'm asking you to ask VDOT to come to Woodward Road and just make, improve those safety conditions. One of them is it's impassable for two vehicles in some, some spots. There is room there to be done. So I'm asking you, I've mentioned this to you, this board before, but I'm asking you to ask VDOT to come to the table, just come to Woodward Road, and just solve some of these safety issues that keeps brought up. They've been brought up since 2020. So that's way past due. So I want you to ask VDOT to come to Woodward Road, just, just make those safety issues improve. It's not a very costly thing. It is something that can be done. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you, we're, we're having a public safety meeting tomorrow night, so we'll have a package of VDOT things that we can include all of that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you, Tommy. Thanks, everyone. Good to see you. All right, who's reading what? Okay, uh, I move that the Rappahannock County Board of Supervisors conduct a closed meeting in accordance with Section 2.2-3711A of the Code of Virginia for the purpose of Consultation with legal counsel and briefings by staff members or consultants pertaining to actual or probable litigation where such cons consultation or briefing in open meeting would adversely affect the negotiating or litigating posture of a public body. For the purpose, purposes of this subdivision, probable litigation means litigation that has been specifically threatened or on which the public body or its legal counsel has a reasonable basis to believe will be commenced by or against a known party. Nothing in the subdivision shall be construed to permit the closure of a meeting merely because an attorney representing the public body is in attendance or is consulted on a matter. Consultation with legal counsel employed or retained by a public body regarding specific legal matters requiring the provision of legal advice by such counsel. Nothing in this subdivision shall be construed to permit the closure of a meeting merely because an attorney representing the public body is in attendance or in consultation on a matter. Section 2.2 dash 3711A8. The subject matter of the closed meeting will be case CL24-16 Connick versus Rappahannock County Board of Supervisors to discussion regarding potential amendments to Rappahannock County Code Chapter 170 zoning and their legal implications. But uh, to be clear, the second item, I think to be even more descriptive relates to um, litigation that's now been initiated. No, the first the first case is litigation CL twenty four sixty one. That's tied with uh, two point two thirty seven eleven a seven. Okay. Actual litigation. The second subject matter is discussion regarding potential amendments to Rappahannock County Code Chapter one seventy zoning and their legal implications. That's tied to two point two thirty seven eleven a eight. And that's consultation with legal counsel um, regarding specific legal matters requiring the provision of legal advice. So, two subjects, two purposes. But 17066K, we saw there was a, a lawsuit filed. Yeah, that's the that's CL 2461. Oh, okay. Got Sorry. It. Okay. I have a motion. Do I have a second? I'll second. Okay, roll call vote. Ms. Comer? Aye. Ms. Smith? Aye. Mr. Whitson? Aye. Mr. Carney? Aye. And I also. All right. Can I just see the van you read it so well? I